Good afternoon, distinguished guests, uh, friends of the Riga Conference community. Uh, yesterday, the heartbreaking news caught attention of uh, all of us, and unfortunately, diplomat uh, Oyars Erik Skalnich passed away yesterday. And uh, he was not only diplomat and only public opinion maker, he was very kind and very friendly person. He was founder of the Latvian Transatlantic Organization. He was chair of the board of this organization and was with us during all Riga conferences all those years. I invite you to join me in a moment of silence. Thank you. Dear friends, one uncertain year filled with uncertainties is in relation to pandemics, but also in relation to politics. But one is certain, and it is Riga Conference. Whatever troubles are around the world, the Riga Conference take place, either in hybrid format or in person. This year we are having 84 speakers some of them are here in the hall, some are there somewhere at their computers. They are representatives of 25 countries. We are going to have 14 panels, five side events and future leaders forum. Six policy briefs have been produced and also an information platform called Secure Baltics is created and everything that you are going to discuss here will remain in this information hub for next conferences to debate. So, the world is filled with a lot of issues. We will start with Europe and we will end up with Afghanistan and we already had a discussion on Indo-Pacific region. We are going to travel 360. What we need, we need patience, we need courage, and we need a lot of ideas which could be passed over to policy makers, to experts, and to younger generation. I wish you and all of us good luck, very intensive and rich conversations, and hopefully in the end we will say that we contributed to the work which is done by politicians and by international community. Good luck, and I pass floor to Edward Lucas for further discussions. Please, Edward. Well, thanks very much indeed, Janetta, and thank you to the organizers. I feel as if my social life, as well as my political life and my professional life, is all restarting, being back in a room with lots of people, many good friends from over many years is terrific. So thank you to the organizers for pushing ahead through all the difficulties to make this conference happen. We're all really grateful. And it's also a real honor to have the prime ministers of Estonia and Latvia here on the panel. I'm sure over the last 18 months, we've really been missing the chance to have face-to-face -face interactions with our um, decision makers. And they're going to give some opening thoughts and then maybe we'll have a short discussion where I'll pose some, some, some questions. And I can't tell you how busy the last year and a half has been. We've got no shortage of things to discuss, whether it's the Afghanistan withdrawal, the ZAPAD um, exercises in Belarus, the weaponized migration, um, the crackdown in Belarus and the terrible suffering of our friends there the tensions within the European Union, the new Biden administration, we could have um, three days of discussions on just those and we wouldn't finish it. But I'm going to start by asking the Prime Minister of the Republic of Latvia to kick us off. Christian, it's great seeing you again. And then after that, we'll turn to um, Kaya Kallis for her opening remarks. Prime Minister, the floor is yours. Right. Thank you very much. Do I sit? Do I stand? I think less movement is good in COVID times, so stay seated. Uh, okay. Uh, so, uh, thank you very much. Uh, it really is a, a great pleasure uh, to be here, and, and even in these times, to be able to uh, address a live uh, auditorium. Um, the way I see it, I think Ms. Ozil and you also uh, touched it off, um, we live in challenging times indeed. Uh, if these words were ever true, uh, they're true today. I uh, took a note of, I counted eight small challenges. I'll just mention them in brief. So one is, of course, the COVID uh, pandemic. Uh, it's not gone in the world. 
certainly in the Baltics right now, we are experiencing our biggest uh, wave uh, to date. The challenge is convincing enough people who are not vaccinated to become vaccinated. In our region, vaccine hesitancy has been uh, unfortunately quite large. And uh, this is uh, uh, causing difficulties also among the healthcare sector. But uh, working uh, step by step, uh, this will be overcome. And uh, this is, has changed a lot in the world. Some things will end up being for the better in terms of efficiency of how uh, companies are working, certainly in terms of efficiency of government. Uh, we are completely, uh, the final vestiges of paper are now fully gone. Uh, so there are some silver linings in that uh, as well. We have uh, our near neighbor, uh, Ukraine and uh, the, the fact of the Crimean annexation by Russia, the ongoing aggression in the Donbas region, this has not changed at all. That challenge remains and uh, has the potential to flare up into an ever larger uh, conflict. We have our southerly neighbor, Belarus. Belarus that, uh, I mean, in the latest round with the elections, which uh, were obviously uh, not uh, legitimate, uh, then uh, with uh, uh, the uh, popular uprising, the massive suppression against their own people. Then in the summer we had the grounding of the plane. And now we have, uh, if anyone is still not clear, what does a hybrid attack look like? Uh, well, we have one which is ongoing even as we speak on the Latvian, Lithuanian, Belarusian uh, border. Uh, where Belarus is organizing people coming from Baghdad and other places and trying to physically uh, encourage them uh, to illegally cross into the European Union. Uh, democracies have a challenge against autocracies, but we have a right and an obligation to defend ourselves, and we will do this. So in Latvia, Lithuania, and Poland, we have effectively closed our border to such illegal activity, and we will keep them closed and uh, not uh, succumb to uh, the hybrid attack from Belarus. We have energy uh, price spikes going on right now. Rather complex reasons, all conflating it at the same time. Uh, this has the potential of creating some social or political uh, unrest. Uh, but it also shows the EU's vulnerability, our overly high dependence on gas and our overly high dependence on one gas producer, Russia. And uh, Russia is currently in the power position of a potential supply manipulator, where uh, President Putin is saying, if you want supplies, have good relations implying if you don't have good relations, you will not have supplies. Uh, and there's also a secondary issue, not less important, that this is coinciding with the move towards green and renewable energies. And as we move away from coal, we move more into gas, and there will be more and more voices around Europe that will raise the question, is climate policy completely well thought out from economic point of view? Then uh, we have Russia as a general threat, already mentioned in terms of energy and uh, the Ukraine, and as a strong supporter of Belarus. Um, the growing autocracy in Russia, the complete silencing of opposition, Navalny is, is in prison like a, like a crow that you keep for others to see what happens if you raise your voice. Uh, the complete intimidation of the opposition is a real problem. Then we have ongoing cyber attacks and disinformation around the world. It's not only in our region. Uh, and it's very clear that Russia is on some sort of offensive. Uh, and it's our uh, job to understand that and to uh, defend and counter. Then we have the challenge of China. Uh, this is a challenge for the entire world, not less for the European Union. Is China a rival, a competitor? Uh, is it a partner? Are they a threat? Probably all of the above. But the European Union needs a coherent China policy. Latvia is uh, one of the members of the so-called uh, 17 plus 1. I think the true model is 27 plus 1. Not groups or individual European countries, but Europe as a whole addressing these challenges. Then we have the somewhat strained relations 
right now with the US. It started in the last uh, government administration, but now with the latest two events, the withdrawal from Afghanistan, uh, from Kabul, which many allies did not fully uh, appreciate the, uh, the, timely, uh, uh, the timeliness of it. And uh, we also have uh, the AUKUS agreement between the US and Australia, which caught France a little uh, off guard. There is no question that the US is remain committed to NATO and to Europe, but we need to work on this EU-US relationship to not let uh, some misunderstandings get, of, get in the way of the good cooperation. And then finally, um, it's what I would call the uncertain role of the European Union as it sees itself in the world. So if you look around the world, you have the US, which is an economic powerhouse and a military powerhouse. You have China, which is an economic powerhouse, and quite clearly evermore as they're also intimidating Taiwan, a growing military powerhouse. And then you have the European Union. No question that we are an economic powerhouse. Uh, but does anyone really think that the EU right now is a military powerhouse? Can we project power if we wanted to in the Indo-Pacific or anywhere else around the world? And uh, I think this is one of the big uh, questions of our time. Where is Europe heading? So I'll give my two cents. Uh, in terms of security and defense for Europe, NATO is and must remain the cornerstone of our strategy and policy. But within the NATO strategy, a stronger and more coherent European Union has its place. Because a stronger and more coherent European Union can address the issue of China, the issue of Russia, the issue of Belarus, how to better uh, US-European relations. And this is what a country such as Latvia is very interested in, is strong friends and neighbors within our treaty alliances not in contradiction Europe or NATO, but Europe as an important partner in NATO that needs to strengthen itself. Thank you very much. Well, thank you so much, Prime Minister, for that um, really comprehensive and insightful tour of perhaps just some of the problems um, that we're facing. I'm, I'm sure we could have listed, listed more. And I'm going straight over to Prime Minister Kalas of Estonia. I think we're all so glad to see the momentum and the decisiveness that you've brought to Estonia's leadership since your government came in. We've, we've missed Estonia a bit over some of the previous years, and I feel now Estonia's back, and your idea of trusted connectivity was a really good hallmark um, for the uh, Three Cs um, presidency when you had that and, and for other things going forward. So I know your Latvian colleague has covered a lot of ground, but perhaps you could give us your distinctive Estonian um, perspective on those issues and maybe some others as well. Uh, well, uh, I don't want to disappoint my advisors who have helped me to prepare the speech, so I will still read the speech and then we go to the debate if that's, uh, that's fine. So uh, I will use the, then I will be a bit taller. <laughs> yeah, ladies, ladies and gentlemen, it's, it's my great honor to be here in Riga today and I'm also happy that these events still take place. So uh, we live in times of uh, multiple uh, crises and transformations. Uh, the COVID-19 pandemic exposed several uh, troubling global trends, uh, including increasing authoritarianism, uh, economic protectionism, and uh, threats to human rights and civil liberties. Uh, according to Freedom House, uh, freedom has been in decline for the past 16 years. And COVID-19 pandemic has further worsened this decline. At the same time, it, international security uh, environment has been uh, growing increasingly tense. Uh, we see constant ongoing attacks uh, that are more complex and are more interconnected. Um, for example, the cyber and influence operations against the United States or other Western democracies have escalated. Um, cyber attacks, use of uh, disruptive technologies, uh, spread of disinformation are 
blurring the boundaries of peace and conflict. Uh, attacks on democratic institutions uh, are on the rise. Uh, dictators are interested in disrupting free and open societies. Uh, they see liberal democracy as a um, dangerous ideology uh, that threatens their power and needs to be defeated. Uh, for achieving their goals, they are willing to deploy corruption, propaganda and even aggression. Uh, so, let me emphasize a few points uh, regarding the way forward. Uh, first, our security is determined by the unity and also the health of our democracies. World order is one of those things people don't think about until it's gone. Uh, the same can be said for freedom, but it's also true for democracy. Uh, we tend to take it for granted. Uh, our democracies are not only challenged by the outside influence, uh, as uh, Chancellor Merkel has recently said, uh, democracy has to be protected, but people should also respect democracy itself. Hence the important question of our times, how can democracies deliver real results uh, for people in a rapidly changing world? Uh, how to keep people's faith in democracy? Second, Democracies must come together and decide how to unite the free world via safe and digital global infrastructure. Uh, digital technology uh, forms a backbone of uh, every uh, infrastructure we build on the 21st century. Uh, modern connections, speed bridges, uh, highways or energy flows rely on technology and data. This means that uh, those who control the technology and data also can disrupt our democracy. So the key questions of the 21st century are how to keep the technological advantage uh, and build digital security so that democracies prevail in competition with the authoritarian regimes. What is the best response to the competition between authoritarian and democratic capital? How to secure the development of new technologies based uh, on democratic values? The shared democratic values of the free world, openness, transparency and the protection of individual rights form the ideological basis uh, uh, and set the rules uh, that um, Estonia tends to brand also uh, trusted connectivity, as Edward Lucas pointed out. And third, uh, we need a strong deterrence, uh, military as well as political. Uh, unity among the allies, as pointed out by uh, Christianis, a strong transatlantic point, bond and US engagement forms a backbone of this policy. Uh, history shows that um, negotiation and dialogue is often uh, not sufficient with the authoritarian regimes. Uh, safeguarding us from hostile regimes also demands military deterrence and we know here in Estonia and Latvia this uh, very well. Uh, NATO allies have strengthened um, its military posture in the eastern flank, uh, solid military presence of the US, UK and Canada in Europe is of utmost importance. Uh, NATO's posture in the Baltic region and Estonia has grown uh, much stronger since it was in 2014. Uh, this demonstrates the strength of uh, transatlantic bond that Canada is present in Latvia, US, um, uh, UK is present in uh, Estonia and, and we work together with our allies here. In conclusion, I'm a firm believer in the EU and transatlantic relations. In fact, Estonia is among the most pro-European nations. And there is no contradiction between uh, being pro-NATO, pro-transatlantic and pro-European. Um, therefore, uh, let us nurture the Atlantic community with the democratic governments on both shores uh, and um, you know, we uh, let us unite the common strategic objectives and uh, by the commitment to an open economic and democratic political system, it has all benefited us, so let's keep it strong. Thank you. Well, thanks very much indeed.
Claire, for that. And I'm, I'm aware that we are now, at the time, this session should have already finished. Um, but we are going to try and, uh, I think we'll have a few more, few minutes of, of, of discussion first before we go on to the UN Secretary General, who is joining us with a pre-recorded video. But um, let me pick up on the China question, because although we talk a lot about Baltic, Baltic unity, and it's certainly true the Baltic states um, cooperate more than they've ever done in their history, we do see quite different policies on China, with the um, Lithuanians taking a very tough stance on both formally leaving the 16 plus one and with their proposal to open a Taiwan office in Vilnius. And that's a distinctive policy. It's attracted a lot of attention in um, the United States, mainly favorable, and a great deal of attention in China, entirely unfavorable. And then we see um, your country, Prime Minister Kallas, saying that you're going to stay in the 17 plus one, which is now 16 plus one, but at the minimum level. And Latvia, perhaps not saying anything publicly, but perhaps you'd like to give us some guidance to your thinking now, Prime Minister. What's Latvia's policy on China and the 17 plus one or 16 plus one? Uh, our policy on China is 27 plus one. That's the nutshell. We're not interested in the other formats so much. 27 plus one is the direction we need to go. And there's a bit of a paradox in this, because if it comes to 27 plus one dealing with Russia, then we're not so happy. I think, Prime Minister Callas, when the EU tried to have a 27 plus one summit with uh, Russia, you and some other countries kicked up a bit of an objection to that. No, but uh, that was, uh, that was um, uh, because uh, Europe had agreed in 2014, when Ukraine happened, that we're not going to have a uh, summit, uh, 27 plus one uh, summit, a very high level summit, uh, before Russia has fulfilled certain conditions. For example, uh, you know, uh, stop the aggression in the Ukraine, give back Crimea. So if Russia hasn't done all these uh, steps and we say that, okay, let's have this meeting, then what signal we give out is that, you know, our, our word doesn't really matter. And, and also that, you know, um, you can just move forward and, and everything you have done in Ukraine is forgotten. And, and for us, I think um, it just sends a very uh, wrong message to to our Eastern partners. Um, uh, and uh, I'm not um, against in having dialogues with Russia, but the question was uh, whether the conditions have been met, and if they have not been met, then Europe would have just looked ridiculous to have this kind of high-level meeting, because all the questions from you would have been also that, okay, what has changed? Nothing. So why do you move uh, towards? I know there was a great deal of gratitude in Ukraine for the stance that um, you and the other allies took in standing up to this Franco-German steamroller. And I'm sure if there were Ukrainians here, they'd be clapping you for that. Um, let me turn to the Biden administration next, because we obviously went through some very difficult years with the Trump administration and some very tough talk about how NATO was um, obsolete. And of course, President Macron echoing that by saying NATO was, was brain dead. And there were really big questions about the, um, the future of the transatlantic relationship. But I think some of the expectations in Europe about Biden have been disappointed, and some of the expectations in the Biden administration about Europe have been disappointed. So the honeymoon, if there ever was one, is definitely over. Um, Prime, Prime Minister Christian, what, 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 what would you like to see from the United States to further s strengthen the transatlantic relationship? And what can Latvia do from its end to contribute to that? Uh, well, uh, first of all, I have to say that from our country's point of view, the U.S. stance uh, towards the Baltics, uh, also during the Trump administration, did not change for the worse by any degree. If anything, you could say that there has been increased uh, U.S. present uh, and investment uh, in the area of defense in our region. So uh, this is something that we note and note very, very positively. Uh, what seems to be changing, though, is that, um, I mean, I also, as a politician, I've been in politics, I realized today for 19 years, it's a, a rather long time. And even during these 19 years, the world has been continually changing. There was a point where the U.S. was the single sole economic and military power in the world after the collapse of the Soviet Union. But that reality has changed. And... Uh, I could say as a Latvian and as a European, 
actually the U.S. needs allies as much as we need US, uh, the U.S. as an ally. Uh, to address the challenges uh, with Russia, to address the challenges with China, um, it's not enough for one. You really need the two. The two large democratic uh, freedom-loving uh, blocs uh, need to uh, unite more strongly to put up an alternative to growing autocracy around the world. So in the Baltics, the US has been, in, in this entire region, including Poland, has been very strong. That's very highly appreciated. We don't see the stance there changing. And what uh, uh, the, the dismay of many with the Trump administration and the expectations that the Biden administration will bring about huge change, I think, is misguided because US internal politics is changing. There is no longer a complete consensus that the US is the policeman of the world. And I think that we have to understand that, that as the US changes, we need to change in Europe as well. And there I can agree with my French uh, uh, counterpart that a stronger Europe within the alliance, that is something that is, that is needed. So in a sense, we need to step up uh, uh, our game and if, if very basic things to finally invest the money in defense that we as NATO members have pledged. In the Baltics we do this, uh, Poland does this, Greece does this, but uh, France of course, but uh, uh, then I think the, the list becomes quite short after that. Uh, so there's, there's a lot that we can do and it's working together with and the realization that actually these two blocks need each other and need to work together. I'm going to come to you in a moment, Prime Minister, but I, I neglected to say that um, we have a hashtag for this conference, which is hashtag RigaConf2021. So whether you're here in the audience or watching on the um, live stream, if there's something that you like, tweet it. If there's something you disagree with it, tweet that too. But let's keep the online discussion going as well for people who are following this on social media. Prime Minister Callas, what's, what's, what, what's, what's your take on my question? Well, uh, U.S. is our ally, and of course what's happening in U.S. internal politics is an issue of, of uh, U.S. internal politics. What is important for us is um, uh, the pledge of, of NATO. And when we had the NATO summit in, in June, then Biden even stressed there that the only time the Article 5 was used was uh, to the benefit uh, of, of U.S. or on the request of uh, United States. So, so therefore, he, he keeps this pledge and this promise as, as very important. And I think for our uh, security here, uh, this is definitely important. But um, uh, it is also important what we do on, on our European side. So we have these discussions going on about the strategic autonomy. And as Christian has pointed out, um, uh, if our armies are stronger, if we invest more in our security uh, in every European army, then we are together uh, stronger here as well. But if, uh, if uh, strengthening or, or uh, building this uh, strategic autonomy means building a separate line of, of command, uh, then it could be very risky for, for countries like ours. Because in terms of crisis, you know, it's not that whether this is the European thing now or the NATO. Uh, so it, it has to be very clear how, how everything operates. And, and, uh, and if we build this uh, alternative, then uh, I'm, I'm very, if it, if it could actually undermine uh, NATO. And the other thing, uh, the signals that we send from our side as well, I think uh, all these kind of disputes between our transatlantic allies um, uh, make me a bit, um, well, uh, nervous in a sense that uh, uh, we are in this uh, free world with the same values and, and as uh, you know, authoritarianism has been on the rise, we have to stick together. Uh, we don't have, I mean, we have the friends we have and we can't uh, push them away. And if we say that, you know, we don't need you anymore, uh, then uh, it might end uh, in a place that is very, very lonely. And uh, we have already been there. If you look at our history, we don't want to be there anymore. Well, talking of loneliness, and I don't want to spend the entire 
20, we, I, I'm now told we have 20 minutes left, which is fantastic, and I hope that your schedulers were consulted with this because they're going to have to do some um, ad, ad, adjustments, I think, but I'm follow, following the instructions I have here. Um, I, I, I think I, I can be excused as perhaps one of the very few British people in the room. I know there's one other, but he lives in the Netherlands. In just asking a quick question about Brexit, because I think there were probably no countries in Europe that were more upset and worried by Brexit than the Baltic states because of Britain's role not only with enhanced forward presence but with our historic ties with Latvia and also Lithuania. And Brexit's done. It was, a, from my point of view, a disaster and I was very upset about it. But um, can you just give me a, a quick take, both of you, on how Brexit's... Um, do, do, you, do you see new opportunities arising for your relationship with Britain? Is Britain still here in the Baltics? Does it matter less or perhaps even more as a result? Prime Minister. Of course, I don't want to comment on how unfortunate I think Brexit is. Oh, I just did. <laughs> but uh, regarding uh, our relationship with Britain, it's as strong as ever. And it's an extremely important partner, both for trade and, of course, also for defense. Uh, Britain is and remains one of the strong uh, NATO allies. They have a very strong presence in our northern neighbor, uh, Estonia. We have an analogous presence of Canada uh, in, in Latvia and the, and the Germans in Lithuania and the, and the US in Poland in the enhanced forward presence within NATO. So this is a strong and vibrant relationship and I'm sure the Brits will sort of sort themselves out. Yes, well, we're certainly, not, that's I think would be fair to say is a work in progress but I'll pass that on to Boris Johnson. Um, Kaya, we are now as important as Canada. That was my um, understanding of what the Prime Minister said. Is that right? Uh, well, I, I echo what, <laughs> what uh, my Latvian colleague says. Uh, Brits are very good friends and, and allies. So uh, we have the biggest uh, British uh, um, presence in, in Estonia in, in our NATO uh, forces. And, and we are uh, very grateful for, for, for this. So, so we continue our our relationship as, as well as, as we can and, and hope that actually uh, everything that is happening in the UK, you see that actually we want to go back to the European Union, so we are welcome. Thank you. Um, in, my, in my dreams. Um, the, um, now, I want to turn to this question that you touched on, Kaya, directly, and also you, Prime Minister, in the, um, about democratic decay, because I've been really struck by how one of the effects of the COVID crisis has been to turbocharge this belief in hoaxes and conspiracy theories, um, not only in terms of what the Chinese are pushing, that this was in a bio, that COVID came from some bioweapons lab in um, China, or the Russians say it came from, some, from the Lugar Center in Georgia, but more generally, the sort of vaccine skepticism, these crazy anti-vaccine um, theories. And it seems to me this, this goes way beyond just the medical questions. This is an attack on the whole idea, on the truth and the trust that under, underpin our whole system. And I'm not sure we have an answer to that. We've seen some discussion of regulation. There's the pressure on Facebook, which is obviously great. We've seen a you know, few tweaks here and there. But I, I, would you agree with me, Prime Minister, that this exposes really a systemic challenge to the way in which our um, democracy and rule of law operate. Um, do you have any answers that we should be adopting either at a national or an international level to try and deal with it? Uh, I wish I, I had the answers, but uh, it's clear that uh, any crisis, it's like in the winter in Latvia, uh, if it goes down to minus 30 degrees, all of a sudden water mains start to break. And it's because uh, uh, when it gets so cold and as the, as the frost moves through the soil, it exposes the lines that are not dug deep enough and they break. Uh, this crisis also is showing th the weaknesses that we have in our society. And it's, it's the technology that we all love. Uh, I, I, I've forgotten what it was like not to have a smartphone and, and to use uh, this uh, application at, at conferences like this um, it, 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 to get news and to get information and to communicate. We can call each other anytime, send messages, and, and it, it's so convenient. But when I came into politics, if you wanted to get a message across, you went to one or two newspapers, one or two televisions, and you covered the entire country because everyone watched the evening news. Everyone read either this daily, or if you didn't like that, you read the other daily. Now, 
if I want to get a message out, I still have to go to the same newspapers and television channels, but then I have to go through all the different social media trying to get people because they're fragmented. And as before, as consumers of information, we consumed edited material. So you've had a little bit of experience uh, in this field, and uh, a, a, an idea which has been vetted through an organized system has a, a degree of veracity that, yeah. that, that's good. Now, I write whatever I want to write. I create my own little account. I get people to follow me, and I realize the crazier things I say. Yeah. And this is, what, this is our weakness in democracy right now. Yeah. Okay. Kaya, go ahead. Well, uh, I think it was even uh, over five years ago, there was a, was a very good book written uh, called The Red Web. I don't remember the authors, but the authors were uh, from, uh, they were Russian journalists. And, and so it was part uh, of how, how uh, you know, Russia also operates uh, in, in web. And, and, and even already then, uh, they were writing that, uh, you know, when the Ukraine, um, Ukraine crisis uh, was there, everybody expected that they're going to have the same attacks as they were uh, uh, attacking us, uh, you know, the detox attacks, but they didn't. What they did was really undermine the truth so that you could get a small lie into Guardian. Uh, so it was published there and then it was spread everywhere and everybody was already pointing that, you know, it was in the Guardian. So, you know, everybody believed this. And, and so uh, what, what it eventually does is that uh, it undermines the truth and the trust. What can you really trust? Uh, and, and you doubt in everything. And now we come to these times of crisis and it clearly shows that this, uh, this undermining uh, the truth in every way uh, works, uh, works against us because uh, people don't know what to believe, what to trust. And, and if it is so, um, then it's very hard uh, to make the decisions and, and also uh, to, to bring the people on board. And we fight this all the time that I'm surprised that you know, nobody believes this, but they do. They do believe this. So, uh, so it's a question of education, I guess, but it's a broader question we can't solve here. I'm getting strict instructions that time is now up, well, but Prime Minister... This is what I wanted to comment on. So here there's a feed from Anonymous saying, ministers have to go, time is up. Is this true? Yes. Uh, is this someone yeah. trying to who get rid of us? I was just a, who, who is, is this? Anonymous? <laughs> well, at least, this it, is a great example. At least it's not... There was a very interesting question that I wanted to answer, and then it went uh, away. It, it says ministers have to go. Well, <laughs> I, 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 for we one, do. welcome the, uh, the admonitions of our new digital overlords, but um, Kaya, Kaya thank, you, thank you so much for highlighting that book, Red Web. I just want to say that's by two dear friends of mine, Andrei Soldatov oh, okay, and thanks. Irina Borogan. And guess what? They're living in London now, like so many others. And if I could just say one thing, please do make welcome those brave Russians who are now having to live in Estonia, Latvia, Lithuania, Poland, Ukraine, wherever. There's so many Russians now fleeing the country without much money, with their jobs in tatters, their families up in upheaval. And I think every, every one of us here in this room knows this. And anything we can do for this new wave of, of, of refugees from Putin is, is, is really important. Um, I want to thank the two prime ministers for um, being so easy to moderate, for obeying our anonymous digital instructions, for running their country so smoothly, for sparing the time to be with us. Um, they're going to leave. You're allowed to clap, but you're not allowed to stand up because we're going straight over to a video message from the Secretary General of the United Nations. But for now, please join me in thanking the Prime Ministers. I'm pleased to address this year's Riga Conference, a unique platform for constructive dialogue on peace and security. Exactly 30 years ago, Latvia and its Baltic neighbors, Estonia and Lithuania, joined the United Nations. As Secretary General, I take inspiration from the strengths of our partnership and your commitment to multilateralism. Today, this commitment is more valuable than ever. Multilateralism is essential to promote efforts for diffusing regional tensions, countering terrorism, confronting cyber threats, addressing pandemic and climate risks, and so much more. But let's be frank. Our multilateral system is too limited, and its instruments and capacities are too focused on the short term. We need to strengthen global governance, and we need the United Nations fit to address the challenges of the future. 
That is why I presented my report on our common agenda, my vision for a reinvigorated, inclusive, networked and effective multilateralism. Anchored in respect for human rights, it outlines measures to invest in prevention and peace building by addressing the root causes of conflict. Increased support for regional initiatives to fill gaps in the global peace and security architecture and place women and girls at the center of security policy. In the face of persistent security concerns and geopolitical divides, the European region needs more mutual engagement and understanding. Even before the COVID-19 pandemic, the global security landscape was deteriorating. Today, we must act with urgency, foresight and purpose to address our shared concerns and we must do so together. The challenges we confront demand nothing less and I thank you. Well, that was, um, and if you didn't realize, that was Antonio Guterres, the UN Secretary General, um, joining us uh, remotely. And I now believe that I've got Edgar Zemkiewicz somewhere is going to come and uh, give us his thoughts on uh, the past years of Latvia's membership of the United Nations. But I don't see Edgar's anywhere, so I'm just talk naturally among yourselves for a moment, and perhaps Edgar's will appear. Mr. Minkiewicz, thank you so much for your time. I really appreciate uh, that you agreed to this interview. Uh, let's start a little bit about history. Uh, 30 years ago, when Latvia joined UN, uh, what do you think was that decisive factor why we were admitted to this organization? Well, I think that's a very easy question to answer because the decisive factor was that the Republic of Latvia regained its independence after 50 years of occupation. Uh, of course, the fact that the Soviet Union collapsed, that international community very quickly recognized uh, the regained independence of the Republic was a decisive one. I've seen uh, some memoirs of diplomats and politicians of the time who were actually describing how difficult prior to coup d'etat in August 1991 it was to knock on the doors of uh, foreign ministries, chancellors of uh, presidents and prime ministers of the Western countries, uh, reminding about uh, the fact that Latvia, Estonia, Lithuania were independent countries occupied by Soviet Union and uh, the fact that uh, those countries, the people of those countries, uh, deserve their rightful place uh, in all the international organizations. There was a very famous episode back in 1990 when uh, there was a summit in Paris on European security and then all three Baltic foreign ministers were asked to leave because and the Soviet delegation protested to our presence. It was less than one year later that due to some historic developments, uh, all three Baltic states were raising their flags in New York and they returned to the organization, I would say returned because we were part of the League of Nations that uh, was the kind of predecessor of the United Nations before the World War II. They returned to the international community. Uh, they took the rightful place that belonged to them, to us, and that we were deprived, not because we were willing to sacrifice our independence or our, our liberty. So I think it was just in one sentence, it was the kind of um, uh, restoration of uh, historic rights and justice. And during these 30 years, what is the specific element we can add to this very big organization which consists of many countries of the world? Well, each and every country is very unique. And uh, each and every country of the United Nations uh, have uh, their own history, their own national traditions, their own 
understanding of what are the priorities in the world. But I think that throughout those 30 years, the fact that Latvia, along with Estonia and Lithuania, uh, was able to uh, restore its independence peacefully, that uh, even in very dark period of 50 years of the occupation, they were people uh, who were demanding uh, and, and knocking on the doors of many of uh, foreign ministries going into demonstrations. Also, by the way, uh, in New York, in front of the United Nations. And uh, we are also celebrating not only 30th anniversary of uh, being admitted in the United Nations, but also 50 years since the Baltic appeal to the United Nations was uh, formed. And that was the moment where all three uh, representatives of all three um, Baltic states were demanding uh, the restoration of historic justice. I think this unique situation where uh, we have been able to show that justice ultimately prevails uh, is uh, one thing that makes us along with our Estonian and Lithuanian friends unique. Nowadays, of course, uh, we are very active UN member. We are very much concentrating on uh, universal human rights and values. Uh, we are well known for at least two very distinct uh, policies. One is uh, gender equality and women rights. And second is, uh, we are always advocating for media freedom, but of course, in today's situation, also fight against what we call now infodemia, that's fake news, information warfare. We have been very active promoting that in different union bodies. And the recent uh, achievement, I would say, was that uh, the resolution that was adopted by UN General Assembly on media literacy that was uh, prepared and co-sponsored by Latvia and Australia was really getting a very huge support. Finally, we are bidding for UN Security Council. We are now a member of uh, ECOSOC, Economic and Social Council of the United Nations. And here, of course, we are bringing what we are very famous for, digital technologies, and also the fact that we are rather green country that is also advocating uh, green economy, new technologies that help to fight climate change. So these are the main uh, issues we would like to raise if we uh, would uh, be the part of Security Council. Indeed, uh, regardless what the outcome of that vote in 2025 is, those are our top priorities when it comes to our work and activities in the United Nations. Those issues were underlined by the President of Latvia, Mr. Levitz, when he addressed the UN General Assembly earlier this year in September. And we will continue working with like-minded nations in the uh, United Nations, in regional organizations to promote those three priorities. But definitely, that's also our kind of landmark uh, priority list, also bidding for UN Security Council seat for the period of 2026-2027. And how about foreign issues? I would imagine that Ukraine would like us to stand for its uh, needs also in Security Council. That's part of what I'm uh, referring to our unique experience of justice and the prevalence of the international law. By the way, when we are talking with our friends from Ukraine, when we are talking with our friends from all around the world, and there is this huge issue of the illegal occupation and annexation of Crimea by the Russian Federation, we keep reminding them, and also there have been many so-called side events be it OEC or UN or, or the Council of Europe um, meetings, where the example of the Baltic states, 
the non-recognition of the occupation of the Baltic states, the international community reminding about this fact uh, and also not uh, following uh, this kind of uh, uh, principle that uh, the might makes the right. Uh, it's a different thing. The right makes might. Uh, we do believe that also our experience, our historic, let's say, background, is also helpful to Ukraine and Crimea. Yes, indeed, the non-recognition of Crimea, the current situation seems to be rather cemented. But we know that if you keep insisting uh, that this is not right, that if there is constant attention to such kind of violations of international law, then ultimately things are going to change. Yes, if we continue about Security Council, there have been talks about uh, reforms in, 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 in this um, uh, in the Council, as we know that there are countries which uh, very often use veto and basically a lot of decisions uh, become in a deadlock situation. We know uh, Russia, China attitude towards many conflicts in the world. Do you agree that, uh, there, the, that uh, some changes would be needed in Security Council? Latvia has been supporting the reform of the United Nations Security Council. Actually, two elements in this. One, what you've just referred, and we have been also supporting some of our friends around the world uh, that have been proposing that when it comes to the gross violation of human rights, look at Syria, look at Ukraine to some extent on what is happening in the uh, Crimea, then uh, all permanent UN Security Council members should refrain from using veto, because human rights violations must get a very strong and swift counter-reaction by international community. The fact that UN Security Council has been paralyzed in the past, and actually in the present, in many of those instances, actually undermines the credibility of the whole organization. It also uh, actually aggravates the situation on the ground. And the only uh, people who are really suffering are those who are on the ground. That's one part. And that should be one part of the reform. Unfortunately, we see that not always this kind of uh, uh, principle of not using veto when uh, the situation is bad regarding human rights is being observed. The second, UN Security Council uh, reflects the reality of 1945, uh, the end of the World War II. We are living in the 21st century. There are already geographical uh, disparities. We do believe that UN Security Council needs to be expanded, both when it comes to permanent and non-permanent member states. We do believe that Africa needs to be represented in UN Security Council, uh, both as uh, at least one seat in the permanent seat category and uh, also in the non-permanent seat category. The same applies to Latin America, the same applies to the Asian continent. And also we believe that uh, Eastern European group needs to be getting one more, an extra seat in what is called non-permanent uh, member states category. Uh, we do believe that uh, there is going to be long debate. There is already long debate. It's not a kind of brand new thing to discuss. But we also believe that if there is no meaningful Security Council uh, reform in observable future, then unfortunately the erosion of the organization is a very, very uh, likely prospect. 
Mr. Dikemic, thank you so much. I wish you a very fruitful Riga conference and also all the best luck in your future work. Thank you very much. Thank you. Well, Ed Gers was too modest to say there, but it's true. He is the longest serving foreign minister in Europe, with the exception of Luxembourg, and uh, has an enormous uh, weight of personal and institutional experience, and Latvia's uh, lucky to benefit from that. I apologize for my mysterious disappearance and re-emergence on the stage, yet more electronic instructions being delivered and then changed. Um, and, and I have to leave now because I'm going to the airport. So I wish you a successful and enjoyable conference. Um, thank you very much indeed for taking part in this opening session. Uh, particularly interesting to hear the two prime ministers laying out their visions of the mess we're in and how to get out of it. Um, I don't think there's any need to applaud, but please enjoy the coffee break. Thank you. Hello, everybody. I, I am the bearer of bad news. Uh, the coffee break is after this session. Sorry about that. Um, so good afternoon, ladies and, and gentlemen. I am Daunis Hours uh, from the University of Latvia. And for the sex, next 60 minutes, I will be moderating this, uh, the first panel discussion of the Riga conference. And I do mean the next 60 minutes. I somewhat disgraced myself last year by allowing my panel to overrun uh, uh, the 60 minutes. And there are few more terrifying sights in the world than the uh, chairman of uh, LATO, the organizing committee, standing behind a camera and making this sign at you to uh, uh, finish, uh, because several ministers of defense are waiting to go for their panel. So, I will be sticking to the 60 minutes that we have on our clock here. Um, the 21st century has seen an acceleration in the European Union's global ambitions. The entry into force of the Lisbon Treaty in 2009 was a key moment and was followed by the establishment of the European External Action Service, which recently celebrated its 10-year anniversary, and other notable institutional reforms and policy developments. However, as the title of our panel, what is still holding Europe back from becoming a global actor? As the title of the panel suggests, the European Union, which has a, a population of 450 million people and has two member states, Germany and France, that jointly spend around 60% more on defense than Russia, the EU is still perceived as not fulfilling its potential. And indeed, uh, a column, a Charlemagne column in The Economist magazine in 2020 wrote that the EU has the trappings of a foreign policy, but not the actual tools. Foreign policy is a botched Kevin Costner project. They built it, but nobody came. So this panel has two main aims. First, we want to look to the past, as well as the present, to identify the factors holding back the EU's foreign policy ambitions. Second, we want to look to the future and consider what is to be done. And we have an extremely distinguished panel with us, both here in Riga and uh, across Europe, to address these issues. So uh, Federica Mogherini, has served as both Italy's youngest Minister for Foreign Affairs and the European Union's High Representative for Foreign Affairs and Security Policy. Um, since September 2020, she's been Rector of the College of Europe. Dr. Weidewitje Freiberger had a distinguished career in academia in Canada before returning to Latvia and twice being elected Latvia's President between 1999 and 2007. Dr. Marian Meyer, 
has had a distinguished career hopping between the worlds of academia and research as a senior research fellow at both the Center for European and North Atlantic Affairs in Globsec and government, uh, where he is currently the Deputy Minister of Defense of the Slovak Republic. And finally, Mark Leonard is a co-founder and director of the European Council on Foreign Relations, the first pan-European think tank, and is the author of several thoughtful books. Uh, I would particularly recommend What China Thinks, and also a, a podcast he hosts, Mark Leonard's World in 30 Minutes. It really is the world in 30 minutes. So, now, um, because all our panelists have extensive professional experience shaping and executing European Union uh, foreign and security policy, in the first round of uh, questions, I would ask them to draw on these experiences and identify the factors holding back the EU from punching its weight on the global stage. And I'll start with uh, Ms. Mogherini, who until quite recently was the European Union's foreign policy chief. Um, and this was an era that spanned the joint comprehensive plan of action deal with Iran, the launch of the EU's global strategy for foreign and security policy, the setting up of the European Defense Fund, as well as rising tensions with Russia, Brexit, and a rocky period in transatlantic relations. Drawing on your time at the heart of power, uh, Ms. Mogherini, um, there are few better placed people to answer the first question of our panel. What, if anything, is holding Europe back from becoming a global actor? And so I hand over to you now. Well, first of all, thank you very much for uh, inviting. It's a pleasure for me to uh, join the Riga conference again. Uh, I remember uh, having participated for the first time uh, still in my capacity, I think, as a member of the Italian Parliament, the Defence Committee. Uh, uh, and it's a pleasure to join you, even if, uh, unfortunately, only virtually. Uh, hopefully, in the coming years, uh, I'll, I'll come back in person again. Um, actually, I was reflecting a lot on the title of, uh, of our panel today uh, before joining, and uh, uh, my sincere answer would be nothing. Nothing holds us back. I and I am not uh, uh, representing anybody uh, anymore, so I don't have any official duty to express official positions. Uh, this is sincerely what I believe. I think that if there is uh, anything that holds us back uh, is our, uh, at times, uh, actually often, uh, our attitude to underestimate our power and our weight in the world. I think that sometimes Europeans um, understand less or believe less uh, in our global role than uh, uh, our partners or interlocutors uh, that are far from being partners uh, all across the globe. Uh, I give you just one example uh, to be short because uh, uh, I'm also interested in hearing the others' uh, um, points of view and I, I submit to the commitment to the 60 minutes. Um, if you imagine taking away uh, for 24 hours all the uh, external actions, all the foreign policy and security policy activities from trade to development so to humanitarian to missions and operations around the world, um, multilateral negotiations, take away for 24 hours all external actions of the European Union across the world and see what happens from climate to conflict. I have the impression that that would be a wake-up call, especially probably for Europeans, to realize that many situations around the world, and including many that are very close to us uh, in terms of uh, geography, but also in terms of interests, uh, would collapse, simply collapse. We give it for granted. Uh, but, the, but the European Union action in the world uh, is, uh, is much uh, deeper and much more relevant than sometimes we realize. Um, I think I'll stop it here because uh, I imagine that you want to make several rounds. Uh, but uh, uh, again, um, this is something I've probably said several times when I was in office. And it's one of those things, of many things I was saying, not because I was in office and it was written in my briefings, but because I really believe in this. Uh, the European Union is a global player. Sometimes we repeat ourselves that we are not, um, but we are. And I, I think what holds us back is sometimes the lack of recognition of power and responsibility. And uh, I would just ask a quick follow-up here. I mean, are, are you suggesting that the European Union already punches at its own weight, uh, as the phrase says? 
but there is little area for improvement? Well, there's always area for improvement. Uh, uh, everybody, uh, all players in the world, uh, from uh, international organizations to um, raising powers or already firm powers, uh, already have margins for improving or expanding their role globally, uh, always. Uh, but I say, what I say is that um, I think that this doesn't mean that we are not playing our role today. Uh, I think we are playing, the European Union is playing its role uh, in the world. There is space for improvement. Uh, I think that we have to be cautious about what kind of interest we have uh, in expanding our role in the world and in which direction, being selective on which are the priorities in which we can invest more. Um, and for sure, this can be a very interesting discussion. But I think, uh, I think we, uh, we, we are unfair to ourselves uh, if we continue to, um, to, to describe the European Union as uh, somehow uh, a, a potential that has not come to, to, to reality. Uh, because I think that actually in the last... Uh, uh, in the last 10 years, I believe that the European Union has developed um, a power in the world. And especially, I have, you, you remember, you mentioned the bumpy moments that we, we experienced during my mandate, during the Juncker Commission. Uh, indeed, uh, we were put to a test on quite some fronts, east, west, south. Just the Arctic was relatively quiet, but the rest was relatively okay, relatively stormy. And I think that even if it was always difficult, always, uh, um, always struggling to get to a common position for sure, and I imagine we will discuss about the qualified majority voting option, it was difficult, but we always came to a common position, we always came to a common action. Again, uh, not always this common action and this common position became uh, an element of a solution of a crisis. Many crises and many conflicts were not solved and are still not solved. But this doesn't mean that uh, uh, the European Union didn't play its role. Actually, in many cases, uh, it was thanks to the European Union, and it is still thanks to the European Union, if some processes are still alive, if some agreements are still alive, think of the Paris Climate Change Agreement, think of the nuclear deal with Iran, think of the many trade agreements that we have concluded around the world in times where uh, protectionism was raising again. Uh, think of the uh, EU-NATO uh, partnership, uh, that uh, has put in place so many uh, concrete projects for uh, helping and supporting NATO to develop in Europe. Uh, think of the uh, PESCO projects and the capability gaps that we can address through that. The list of things that have been put in place, I think, is, is sometimes underestimated. Again, has this, con has this contributed to solve or improve the situation in the world? I believe yes. Many different fields. Again, so much that if you would take that away, uh, you would definitely notice the difference in negative terms. Has this, con has this solved all the problems in the world? No. But has the US foreign policy solved all the problems in the world? Has, ha have the United Nations solved all the problems in the world? Is there anyone that has solved the problems in the world? Probably and unfortunately not. But this doesn't mean that we have not become uh, a global player, again, always uh, margins for improvement with a clear mind. And I hope that the strategic compass that is uh, now being finalized uh, under the leadership of uh, Borrell uh, will help identify the strategic directions in which further investment can be done in developing and strengthening further the uh, European foreign and security policy uh, and defense one. But I believe that uh, um, saying uh, or hinting at the fact that the European Union is not a global player, I think uh, is simply out of touch with reality. And no one around out there, in, inside Europe, this can be a position that many could have, but uh, at least in my experience, in my still in my contacts with uh, um, friends and colleagues in the world, nobody would doubt that the European Union is a global player out there. Okay. Apart from Thank our enemies, but this is, this is part of the narrative. Thank you, Ms. Mogherini. Now I, I jump across the river here in uh, Latvia uh, to visit Madam uh, President. So, uh, Dr. Freiberger, do you agree with this uh, upbeat, uh, positive assessment of the state of European Union uh, foreign policy? Um, I think your microphone is turned off, uh, Madam President. 
Sorry, Mr. Yes. Chairman. Uh, I think back to the, to the various stages uh, of European uh, policy formation since my repatriation over 20 years uh, ago from, from Canada. And I have seen a tremendous growth, and I think this is what Madame Mogherini, uh, by the time she arrived uh, on the scene, uh, there had been made, uh, really, I thought, tremendous progress from the Europe I arrived back in, uh, and the one she took over as our uh, representative abroad. Uh, but uh, the European External Action Service is only 10 years old uh, in a sweep of history. That's nothing. In other words, what is lacking in Europe and preventing it to be punching at its level of weight is a lack of awareness of belonging to a European community that is, uh, if you like, a notch above their identification with their national and regional identity. And as we heard our Prime Minister earlier say that there's no contradiction between uh, wishing to strengthen NATO and wishing to strengthen European defense. So there is absolutely no uh, contradiction between being identified as a patriotic Italian, uh, Estonian or Latvian, uh, and a patriotic, uh, if uh, of course these words are going out of fashion, I don't know what else to find as, as a designation for the feeling of belonging and of being identified with this larger entity, Europe. What is Europe? We, we talk of Europe, but then we must realize that the European Union is a particular construction within Europe, and not Britain and not Norway and not Switzerland are part of it. Uh, so that uh, we must be, first of all, specific, but uh, I think for simplicity's sake, yes, I think we can say that EU, uh, we will call ourselves Europeans and the others will call whatever they wish to call themselves. And it is a patchwork, a patchwork of strengths, of achievements, of potential, of impact in the world, uh, which if you sum it up together, as we did in, uh, in, the, in the group between 2007 and 2009 on the, the group on the future of Europe, and we discovered that by doing a summation, uh, were it only for the uh, gold medals won at the Olympics, Europe had this fantastic weight, but nobody ever presented it in such a sense. Uh, uh, I was present uh, in the Netherlands just before uh, the Netherlands um, said no to the veto to the European Constitution. I was uh, sitting there on the same platform with Giscard d'Estaing, who, who was, was the initiator and uh, main author of, of this drafting. Uh, uh, the, uh, Queen Beatrix was there in person to try, and, and, and Prime Minister Balkenend, to try and convince the Dutch population that really this would be for the common good for us to have a constitution. But curiously enough, both France and, 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 and the Netherlands did not agree to, uh, to this constitution and therefore Europe did not because there were feelings of things that we could not identify with one reason or another. The uh, External Action Service, when it was created, I, I remember, uh, I think, I think it was uh, President Gonzalez from a, from a reflection group and I, we went, uh, and Jorn Olila uh, as vice presidents to visit the first president uh, of the uh, European Council uh, and, and also visit the first uh, external action representative after the Lisbon Treaty came into effect. And uh, we were told that they had no offices, they had no staff, uh, I remember when I regularly went to Brussels, uh, going by this building that was being built for the Future Action Service. That, and, and there you had symbolically, you look at it and you see the foundations were not even laid yet. They were destroying the old buildings and knocking them down next to the hotel where I was saying. And then slowly it was built up. Uh, to sum up, Europe is uh, a project that is still not 
completed. Uh, it started way back as, as a, well, an adumbration of what it would be in the future. I think that Schumann and Monet had a very clear idea where they were going. They also realized the, the obstacles that they had to face. And they, they did it as the French say, à la diagonale. You know, they, they approached it sort of very, very cautiously as experienced politicians. They said, let's, let's start on some, with something concrete, very concrete, visibly beneficial to both sides, in this case, Germany and France, um, uh, and, uh, and make, make a common effort of what used to be for the last three wars, uh, one of the reasons for killing each other massively by the millions, decimating the male populations of these countries. Uh, that was a fantastic leap of faith into the future of Europe. But the subsequent steps, just think of it. We here in Eastern Europe, our countries were under communist rule behind an iron curtain, in our case, until 1991. 1991 uh, is, <laughs> of course, for younger people, that's uh, already reading the history. But for people my age, it's very vivid in our memories as a drastic, an absolutely drastic change in what in this divided Europe, uh, cut in two, but simply cut in two. And I saw actually uh, at the frontier between uh, the Czechoslovakia and, and neighboring countries, uh, the barbed wires, the, 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 the towers, the dogs, the, the, uh, everything. As, as I came once from an international conference on, on the brain functions from, from Prague to, to Paris, uh, that, that Europe, thank God and thank heavens, is no longer what we are facing. But it had to be integrated, it had to be built up so that this patchwork you have the patchwork of history. You have the patchwork uh, of geography uh, working against a, a unified sense of Europe. But on the other hand, uh, I think the structures have been put in place. The ones that Madame Magherini was, was, was pointing out and in which she was, she was the second, I believe, our external representative. Well, that's, that's very new. What can you expect from a newly created uh, uh, sort of administrative function. I think they did heroic efforts in terms of actually setting this thing going. So that what I see as a challenge for Europe is to get politicians and citizens equally accepting and understanding what it ha means to have a hierarchy of identifications and of loyalties and of commitments and of futures that are not in contradiction, but are that where we create synergies, where together we are stronger than some of the parts and where we have, we are already accomplishing. The European Union members are already the biggest donors of international aid in the world. But it, that's not really the way it is presented. We have separate countries give, giving, making separate donations and so on. The European Union has its own projects in addition to that. And um, it's, uh, it's still a patchwork. I think it's the summation, the integration uh, of uh, European efforts as an EU uh, uh, process uh, that is going on, it is continuing. There are still countries in the Western Balkans that are knocking at the door. Um, this process will involve, I think, young people traveling across Europe with the Erasmus and other programs who are, in my mind, that are essential uh, to, to create a European identity. Uh, they are being advanced by projects such as uh, European film industry. They are being advanced by having a European um, prize in literature, uh, where literary works from, from different countries in, in Europe uh, are uh, being uh, evaluated for, for just, uh, I think, nearly, <laughs> nearly 15 years ago, I, I p participated in a French initiative that started out with the first uh, European Literary Prize 
and I, I was part of the jury. And, and we, uh, we deplored the fact at the time that the evaluation of many good authors uh, was hampered by the lack of translations. Nowadays, we have much more access to the literature uh, written in the various languages uh, of the European Union. And that sort of consciousness, that sort of ability to sympathize, to empathize, to identify oneself as having the same interests as a European with one's neighbors, as well as those far away. The Canary Islands are very far away, but I follow every day what is happening on the island and what is happening with the volcano, because I somehow feel that is part of Europe and that is also of concern to me way up here in the northeast. Uh, of uh, of the European Union, so that I I don't think Europe has reached its full potential uh, potential and full 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 uh, power in the world. Uh, it it has separate countries that have fantastic power, and as I say, their addition together in one sort of punch uh, would be much more powerful than it is now. But the process is going on. Um, um, God willing, it will continue, uh, uh, but I, I wouldn't guess as to the date on which we, we would really be uh, considered by, by worldwide, um, say by, by the journalists uh, of America or of China or of Australia uh, as being a superpower in the world. We, we have a bit of work to do for that. Thank you, Madam President. And so. Um... I think our first two speakers on the panel are very optimistic, and they've emphasized that it's about perceptions, that in actual fact, uh, uh, the foreign policy is working much better, it's much more effective than generally the public uh, uh, thinks. Uh, what's the view from Slovakia? I think it's, uh, mm, this discussion is a matter of uh, perception and maybe expectations. Uh, uh, we. I, I completely agree with uh, Madam President and uh, Ms. Mogherini that uh, we shouldn't blame ourselves and we sh shouldn't beat ourselves that we are not doing enough. Uh, but at the same time, we should think about, uh, and uh, maybe that will be another round of uh, your question, what, uh, what should be done uh, in another way or, or what could be done uh, more. Uh, the perception, uh, uh, when, I, when I was saying that a uh, uh, matter of expectations, uh, maybe we are expecting... Uh, from, I don't know, the expert public uh, uh, media and, uh, and um, some people who are involved, uh, we are expecting too much uh, from the European Union. Uh, but the uh, European Union is not the same, it's not the unanimous uh, actor. Uh, that's, that's reality. So it means that uh, without more political cohesion, uh, it's uh, very hard to expect uh, that it will be more cohesion on individual uh, issues. Uh, including uh, foreign policy and, and, and security policy. So, so it means that uh, we, we, we cannot expect uh, that uh, we'll, uh, we'll do the same as the uh, United States, for example, or uh, not comparing with, uh, I don't know, China or, or, or these countries. So, uh, so uh, within the framework, uh, which is possible, I think that framework is exploited uh, Quite, quite much, uh, uh, and uh, and uh, we are doing what we can actually, uh, what we can actually do. On the other side, it's it's uh, uh, it's true that uh, maybe it's uh, it's uh, there is a lack of uh, political will in some uh, particular uh, things. Uh, speaking about, uh, for example, uh, my portfolio. I'm not happy that uh, beta groups uh, have been not deployed in 15 uh, or, or how many years uh, since they have been created. We had uh, so many uh, chances, so many opportunities, uh, and we didn't do that. So, so on the other hand, we could, can uh, do more, and we should do more. Uh, yes, it's a matter of uh, perception uh, and, uh, and uh, some differences uh, between, uh, between uh, capitals, of course. Uh, but uh, this kind of uh, decision making and uh, and uh, maybe internal structures uh, it's a little bit complicated and uh, it uh, takes us uh, away from 
uh, more, uh, and more rapid uh, action. So, uh, so uh, generally speaking, uh, I, I, I wouldn't say that the uh, European Union is not a global actor. It is, as, as it was uh, said uh, on numerous uh, cases. Uh, but on the other side, we, uh, we can be and we should be uh, more visible and more active. But uh, that's the question whether we, we want to be uh, more active. With uh, strong populism around the world, uh, and uh, including Europe, uh, uh, anti-European uh, positions and narratives uh, from many political parties which are very strong in, uh, in the European Union, uh, I'm not, uh, I'm not uh, so keen to, uh, to expect that uh, uh, there will be too much change uh, in upcoming uh, future because uh, I don't uh, see appetite for more political cohesion uh, and, 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 and uh, something like a new Maastricht uh, Treaty and, and creating uh, something uh, much stronger than uh, what we have. We'll be happy to keep those countries which are already in the European Union inside no, because they are strong, uh, strong uh, uh, sentiments uh, for, uh, for uh, maybe leaving the uh, European Union in some uh, particular countries. Uh, so, so that's why I, I, I would be, uh, I, I think that we should be realistic. Uh, we should find uh, and we should discuss uh, the things, uh, uh, what, uh, what, uh, uh, what we can do more, uh, but, uh, but at the same time uh, there is no space for blaming ourselves and, uh, and uh, uh, this is also the message uh, for those who are writing about the European Union and, uh, and uh, these issues or, or commanding uh, that, uh, uh, that uh, sometimes uh, some kind of uh, confidence in, in, into ourselves uh, should, be, should be more uh, emphasized uh, in these, uh, in these uh, messages. Okay, thank you. Um, you raised some interesting issues there about uh, being a lack of interest um, among mem member states to, to toughen up the mechanisms of uh, the uh, common foreign and, and security policy, or indeed uh, a new treaty arrangement. But for now, we're going to go to Mr. Leonard. Um, and I'm going to start with a question you've probably been asked many times in recent years, but I've never asked it, so uh, I'll go ahead with it. Um, so a decade and a half ago, you pub published a splendid book entitled Why Europe Will Run the 21st Century. Do you still believe that Europe will run the 21st century? Thank you very much. So I'm, I'm here in Brussels um, in the Bellemont building um, looking out um, at uh, uh, all of the, the different people who are trying to, to help Europe run the 21st century and to, to, to survive um, uh, as, a, as a global player. And I, I agree very much with the other speakers that we are on a, a journey um, and uh, it's an incremental process. Rome is not built in a day. But at the same time, uh, I do sometimes feel that we are uh, trying to climb up a uh, an escalator that's going down and the escalator has been speeded up over the last few years. Um, you know, I think Europe is a real global player in some areas, but I don't think that we do ourselves any favors if we uh, pretend that everything is, uh, is, is going really well, because there is a, a huge gap between the potential which the European Union could have to be an actor on the world stage and the reality um, of how we're seen in many parts of the world. And your question at the beginning was what is holding us back? And I think there are two things, you know, briefly that, you know, one is the world <laughs> and the other is ourselves. Um, when it comes to the world, the EU was built on a very simple idea, which my book, Why You're All Around the 21st Century celebrated, which was the idea that Binding nations and peoples together creates peace. It makes war unthinkable. And by building a, a community uh, around coal and, the coal and steel that we use to build weapons, the EU managed to turn enemies into friends. Uh, and after the end of the Cold War, Europeans hoped that by opening borders, promoting trade, travel, the internet, that they could uh, spread these same lessons to the rest of the world. And that, in a way, was what my book was trying to celebrate, the idea of of creating a different notion of, of how the world could be organized to that which has defined geopolitics for the last few centuries. But, um, and I still believe passionately in that vision, but it, 
would be dishonest to say that the world had followed that uh, that vision over the last decade and a half. Um, and I think that the world that we're living in is, is, is shifting quite far away from that dream. On the one hand, we're seeing a, a turn from multilateralism to great power competition, uh, particularly the competition between China and the US. But on the other hand, and this is the, the biggest challenge which, which the European Union faces from, from the world, is that because China and America are terrified of having a war with each other, a nuclear war, what they're increasingly doing is um, competing by manipulating the very things that link them together. And geopolitics has become a bit like a loveless marriage where the couple can't stand each other's company, but are unable to get divorced. And as with an unhappy couple, it's all the good things that brought us together in the good times that we're using to, to harm each other in the bad times. In a marriage that goes wrong, it's about who gets custody of the kids, who gets the holiday home, the pets. But in geopolitics, what we're seeing is that all of the different ties that bind us together, whether it's trade, whether it's infrastructure, the internet, technology, or even solution to, to global problems like the pandemic and climate change, which are being turned into, into weapons. And uh, that is leading to a completely different um, notion to, to those, that which Europeans kind of believed in. We thought that building interdependence would create peace, would eliminate conflict. And what we're now seeing is that um, it is interdependence which makes many people feel vulnerable and which is uh, leading to uh, a state of, of, of perpetual conflict between different parts of the world. That's quite a profound shift which we have to to get our heads around and which we need to reorganize ourselves on. And that, that brings me to the second problem, which is ourselves. And I think that while the world has been changing dramatically, we have not been changing uh, as quickly as before. Um, you know, it's taken a long time to implement a lot of the, the things that we tried to do over a period of time. We had a sort of two decades of, of trying to integrate Europe and to liberalize it by creating the euro enlargement etc and now we've had a decade and a half of disintegration and of dealing with a lot of the design flaws in in in, in integration um, and uh, though people talk about a geopolitical commission about strategic autonomy strategic sovereignty there isn't yet a, a kind of habit of thinking strategically and of putting the enormous assets, whether it's our trade, our economic power, our competition policy, in the service of, of geopolitical uh, goals. Um, and, you know, we're a long way from having a euro that can allow us to be free from uh, economic coercion from, from other players. We're a long way from, from building a European pillar in NATO that can make us a proper partner to the, to the United States of America. Or we're able to act on our own if the US isn't interested. Um, but also we organize our, thing, uh, our, our institutions and our power in a way that fragments them, not just between member states, but actually uh, we still operate as if there is an iron curtain between the economy and, and geopolitics. And that's very different from the way that the United States of America or China or other powers act. Um, I think that we're making baby steps towards uh, closing that gap and putting in place some institutions which can allow us to, to think about how we can uh, become more powerful. But uh, going back to your question about Europe in the 21st century, I used to think that um, it was possible for a kind of one power to, to try and shape how the 21st century would be run. Increasingly, I realized that actually that the big goal for Europeans is to, to survive the 21st century as the sort of Kantian community that we want to be in. And that our goal, instead of trying to convert others and to, to, to be on a sort of global transformative vi uh, mission, which we, which, uh, which we felt we were on 15 years ago, is to try and preserve these, these values and these ways of working within our continent. And that is more of a kind of project of European exceptionalism that rather than one of, of universalism. Um, it's still a noble goal, but I think that that's what lies behind a lot of this talk about strategic sovereignty and strategic autonomy is a sense that we can't convert 
the Chinese, the Russians, the other, other powers to live in the sort of world of, of, of international law and shared sovereignty that we're trying to build in Europe. So the very least we should try and do is to protect ourselves from um, seeing those values uh, undermined within our continent, either by external action or by the challenge which comes from the fact that a large minority of the European population feels that they've been left behind and is therefore pushing back against interdependence. And um, those two challenges from the outside world and from our own people, I think are, are quite profound. And we're not gonna be able to, to, to face up to them if we don't really recognize them and um, start to put in place uh, some really serious actions which can stop the rot from, from destroying a lot of the beautiful ideas which the European project has stood for for the last few decades. Thank you, Mr. Leonard. Now, time is uh, ticking. I already said at the start, I'm terrified of the organizers and slipping behind uh, schedule. Hmm. We have 16 and a half minutes, and uh, we still have a second issue, the prescriptive part of our discussion, what we should do. And I know Mr. Leonard has been gently whispered into my ear that you have to leave us at uh, uh, 16 o'clock Latvian time sharp. So I'm going to turn to you first and ask, also ask kindly if you could be quite, quite uh, uh, compact in this, uh, in explaining, you know, I mean, basically, take two minutes to tell us what we need to do to tackle the challenges uh, of the 21st century that you said, so we can move beyond perhaps just, just surviving the 21st century and having a, uh, a Europe which leads uh, the 21st century. Um, I'm very sorry about, about this, but um, basically, I think the, the Geopolitics in the 21st century is going to be about uh, weaponizing globalization. And we believe in a, in a rule-based order in these different areas. So we need to be, have develop the tools to, to defend it. And we also need to, to bring political thinking into these different areas. So when we think about supply chains, we shouldn't be thinking about just in time and about um, uh, minimizing the costs of things, but we should realize that, that um, uh, people might use them to manipulate us, to attack us. So we have to, to have a kind of different approach, which is, uh, allows us to, to build in redundancies, to be more resilient. Um, we need to develop the euro so that it can allow us to push back on secondary sanctions by, uh, by other countries that are trying to weaponize the global financial system. We need to invest properly in, uh, in, in European defense and the European pillar of NATO. We need to have the right forums so that we can we can get our heads of state and government to, to, to think and act more uh, more geopolitically and we need to, to to rewire the institutions in brussels as well so that you can actually insert geopolitics into our trade policy into our competition policy into all these other areas this isn't a new agenda it's what we were trying to do when we created federica's uh, uh job in uh, in the lisbon treaty um, but it's been remarkably difficult to, to, to make that beautiful dream into a reality. And I'm not sure that the world is going to wait for us uh, to carry on at the pace that we've been working in recent years. So um, I think we need to, to wake up and, and we do need to, to, to get Team Europe to, to really pull together in a, in a fundamentally different way. And that's very, very difficult with national politics going in the way that it is in, in many of our member states. Okay, thank you. Now, Ms. Mogherini, uh, Mr. Leonard tells us that we need to wake up. Um, he's perhaps less optimistic about the, uh, uh, the state of uh, Europe's global uh, uh, role than you are. Um, how would you respond uh, uh, to what he said? Uh, uh, would, would you agree with these comments? And again, if you could keep it nice and short, around two, two minutes. Well, Mr. Minutes, um, I, I, I might surprise you, but I actually probably uh, even less optimistic than he is. Uh, when it comes to the possibility for us to lead the foreign policy or the globalization of the, of the geopolitics of the 21st century. I think that we want to succeed in our expectations, we have to get our expectations right. And uh, um, I, I was asking myself, do we really want to lead this century geopolitics? Is this for us? I think that we have to be uh, realistic uh, on, on what we need to do and what we can do. Um, and I think that the world of today is a world that uh, uh, cannot actually be led by one single force globally, uh, far from being us. 
uh, on top of this. But I think that also the United States cannot lead the geopolitics of this uh, of this century alone, and, and neither can, can anybody else. So I think that if we set up our expectations, our goals right, I think that what we can do is, uh, and again here I'm, I'm probably less optimistic than Mark, is probably uh, contribute to, to avoid the worst developments to happen. Uh, in, in this trends that we see happening in the world. Uh, it's a weaponization of globalization, as, as Mark rightly mentioned. It's uh, uh, increasing tensions and, and uh, uh, conflictuality and competition uh, worldwide uh, and regionally, within regions and across regions and among regions. Uh, and it's an escalation uh, of uh, uh, all uh, different trends that we Europeans have tried to contain or actually dismantle with our own uh, institutional build-up. Uh, Madam President mentioned very wisely uh, the fact that we, we started a long journey 70 years ago. Some of us joined us uh, when, well, when I was in high school. I perfectly remember 91. It's really recent history. Uh, and, and, and we made a miracle in Europe. Uh, we made a miracle um, overcoming fights and wars of, uh, of thousands of years. Uh, and uh, bring in democracy and economic and social developments uh, uh, almost in the entire continent. Uh, and still the work is not completed because we, we still have, uh, as, uh, as Madam President mentioned very rightly, uh, we still have the Western Balkans to, to integrate in our union. And, um, and I hope we'll do this as soon as possible. So we managed to, to, uh, to go in the cooperative way in our continent uh, because we learned the lessons the many lessons we have to learn. And I think that uh, today we recognize and we see that the, the world trends are not the same as the ones we have been investing in in the last 70 years. Uh, the world trends are not so cooperative ones, are, are, are rather the opposite. And I believe our aim, our goal and our mission in these times can be that of liaising and networking with all the like-minded uh, partners we have around the world on different topics and avoid the world to go in the wrong direction, in our view, uh, to, to go conflictual, to go to, go to, a, to a renewed Cold War or even worse, towards a, a conflictual uh, scenario. Um, I think that this is something we can do. We can succeed in avoiding the wars. Um, can we succeed in leading the century? That might maybe a little bit too much as a geopolitical ambition for now, not because of our shortcomings, but because of the reality of the world today. We are a multipolar world. No one in the world can lead alone. Okay, thank you so much. And uh, Madam uh, President, you emphasized several times in, in, in your first intervention that the European Union project is not completed. But at least in, in, in terms of thinking about how to enhance the global role of the European Union, what do you think are the you know, two or three steps which should be taken as soon as possible in order for us to, to, to achieve this uh, aim. And again, I'd be grateful if we could fit into a, a couple of minutes. Decisions uh, about uh, both uh, policy within the boundaries of the European Union and outside of it uh, are taken by heads of state and government. Heads of state and government in democratic countries uh, sometimes have a, a very short shelf life. Uh, they, they change uh, as the populations change their minds about which parties are most popular. And this is the, the advantage of democracy and it's also uh, a weakness. Uh, democracy is a fragile flower. We have to keep tending it. We have to keep watching it and defending it. And one way uh, of doing that is, is to ensure that extreme, extreme positions, uh, those advocating hate towards others, advocating violence, advocating, advocating uh, suspicion, paranoid suspicion of not just governments, but everybody around except you and me, and I'm not sure about you, you see, I'm only sure about myself. Uh, these can undermine uh, the democratic process, and never mind uh, any kind of broader uh, uh, convergence uh, of positions. We see across Europe, both the extreme right and the extreme left of the political spectrum 
are being, in my understanding, uh, being used uh, as, uh, as instruments of hybrid uh, warfare on the part of countries or, or regions. Uh, it's, it's difficult always to identify just exactly who the authors are, but of entities, shall we say, who are not happy with the idea of a strong Europe who are not happy with a whole region, uh, most of a continent, that is absolutely devoted uh, to the ideas of uh, multiple polarity, uh, rule of law, civil rights, etc., etc. They are not happy because they do not want to practice, nor do they like uh, Europe preaching it. They don't even like Europe living it. Never mind, we, we, even if we give up our idea of preaching to the world, which we, which we easily do, but we do wish to keep it for ourselves. And this is where we really have to watch. The, uh, the role of the uh, modern uh, social platforms and media creates echo chambers, which first of all, uh, sort of, um, uh, I think hypnotize their followers into certain ideas uh, and then amplify, they serve as amplifiers and the silent majority, the majority of citizens who actually are, are reason, reasonably rational, uh, as rational as, as the average person can be, uh, and committed to democracy, are, are being sort of pushed into the background by the loud, amplified voices by, by the media uh, uh, and, and the electronic echo chambers and bots and uh, everything else. And I think that we will have to be, I think, uh, both artificial intelligence, but also uh, social media uh, will have to be really seriously, uh, I think, uh, understood, better understood and studied and practiced. Uh, yeah, because I, I see the slippery slope uh, opening up here for extreme ideas. Europe had them in the 1930s and look at where it led it to, you see. Then it sort of woke up after the brutal bloodletting, and now it seems to be slipping back into the sort of things we saw, uh, uh, extreme right and extreme left, as, as we saw in the 1930s. And that is something we really should not allow to happen. Thank you. Dr. Meyer, you hold an executive position, the Deputy Minister for uh, Defence. What would you like to be seen done to, to, to uh, toughen or, or to tighten up uh, Europe's global role? Uh, first of all, uh, as I said, we need to keep uh, pro-European parties uh, in the governments. Uh, of course, it's, uh, it's, uh, 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 I'm not saying that uh, uh, so much seriously, but, uh, but this is, uh, this is uh, uh, the answer. You, 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 you need to have a strong support uh, from the uh, capitals, otherwise uh, the European idea uh, will disappear. Uh, on, the, on the more pragmatic uh, uh, view, uh, I would say that uh, there are some, uh, some potential tools uh, which uh, could be used. Uh, now, uh, uh, there is a strategic compass, uh, the, the document uh, which should be a strategic uh, document uh, for upcoming period is discussed. And, uh, and uh, what I heard uh, so far, and I've been in Brussels uh, discussing with EU representatives uh, last week, is very promising. Uh, uh, I think uh, we we know what uh, wh where is the problem, what uh, what to uh, what uh, where to focus uh, our attention. Uh, we know that uh, EU needs to adapt uh, to the new uh, reality, uh, completely different than it used to be uh, 10, 15 years ago. Uh, and there are also some procedural, uh, maybe. Uh, tools which uh, can be discussed. Uh, I'm not saying uh, they need to be changed, but uh, for example, uh, to, to have uh, unanimous uh, voting in, uh, in the security and defense, uh, maybe that is a question whether uh, the change in this, uh, in this field uh, shouldn't, be, uh, shouldn't be good uh, uh, towards more rapid uh, action when I was mentioning, for example, European uh, battle groups. So, I think uh, that uh, we, we need to find, uh, we need to uh, 
precisely defined uh, tools uh, which uh, should be helpful uh, in, in rapid reaction because this is what, what uh, we are blaming for, uh, that uh, we are not uh, visible enough uh, sometimes, uh, we are not uh, active enough, uh, we are not rapid enough. Uh, example of Afghanistan evacuation, although it was not uh, European actually uh, operation, European Union was invisible. Uh, it was uh, only a responsibility of uh, national, uh, national, uh, national states uh, there. So, uh, so there, uh, those are uh, maybe good examples where European Union should be more active and, uh, and we should be discussing potential tools within the framework we have, the political framework we have, uh, to, to, to make it uh, more, uh, more credible uh, or to, to make it more active and uh, on the, on the uh, following uh, side uh, more credible. Thank you, Dr. Meyer. Now, we have time for one quick question, and this is a, a, we've had some questions come in, but there's one question which I think can be answered reasonably quickly, and which was directed at Mrs. Mogherini. And the question asks, uh, Mrs. Mogherini mentioned that the EU had a southern, northern, and eastern, western test. Uh, meaning the economic and migration crisis and Ukraine in 2014. Uh, did the EU pass this test? Uh, that's, uh, it's difficult to say a yes or a no. I think that, uh, well, we passed the test. Uh, uh, that was also an internal test because uh, during those five years we had indeed uh, uh, war on Ukraine, uh, war in the south uh, and in Syria and in Libya. Uh, the refugee crisis, uh, uh, the change in administration in the United States, uh, rising China, but also the Brexit referendum. So we also had an internal test. We succeeded in the terms that we survived. And the union uh, uh, that I would like to remind us all in uh, summer 2016, many were saying would have collapsed completely. Uh, you remember that after the Brexit referendum, many were saying that this would have been the beginning of the end, that, that many other countries would have followed the same way. Uh, instead, here we are, I think, stronger than we were in 2016. So, yes, we have succeeded the test internally uh, as the European Union. We have not managed to uh, solve the crisis that we have had around us. We have managed to keep good relations with the United States uh, uh, during the changes of administrations, which was not to be given for granted at certain moments uh, and it was something that for me was always a priority to keep the transatlantic partnership strong even in times of difficulty. Uh, we didn't manage to solve uh, um, completely or to solve the situation in, in Ukraine for instance or, or in Libya or in Syria but uh, if it was not for the European Union the situation in, uh, in Ukraine for instance uh, and you know this very well in, in Riga uh, would have uh, deteriorated much more than it has been the case uh, and all the support package that we put in place uh, to support the reforms uh, in the country so it's have been literally vital for, for Ukraine itself. Um, the same goes with Libya or Syria. But we invested in the resilience of, of societies and, and um, institutions uh, wherever we could, which was, I believe, uh, a way of uh, succeeding the test. So we didn't uh, succeed with uh, uh, 10 out of 10, but I would say with uh, 7.5 out of 10 as a mark, uh, I, I would say we, we have. Yes. Seven and a half. Well, on the Latvian grading system, that's halfway between good and very good. So it's a, it, it's a pretty good, good, yeah. good score, I think. Um, thank you uh, to all the panelists. Uh, our time has run out. We started our discussion quite optimistically. Then uh, uh, we were a little bit more pessimistic, as Mark Leonard pointed out, that we just need to survive the 21st century. And then we had some concrete proposals from uh, Dr. Meyer and some of our other panelists. So many thanks to uh, uh, Madam President, Dr. Vici Freiberger, to uh, Federica Mogherini, and uh, uh, to uh, Dr. Meyer here, and also Mark Leonard, who has already left us. And now, my friends, you have earned your coffee break. Okay.
Hello. Hello, Nick. Hello. How are you today? I'm well, thank you. How are you? Uh, thank you very well. Uh, I can see from the...
Okay. Uh, messages. Okay. Okay. So we're already suffering from the countdown. <laughs> Our time is dis disappearing already. <laughs> okay. Right. Okay, I'm rather inclined to start on the basis that people will turn up if we, uh, if we do. Hmm. Okay, I'm going to start. Okay, ladies and gentlemen, as the countdown cursor has already started, and time waits for no man or woman, particularly at the Riga conference, therefore I am not going to hang around and wait for everyone to turn up, and hopefully the voice and the image on the TV screens outside will encourage people to turn up uh, a little faster. So. Uh, this afternoon, and for this now under an hour, we're going to talk about is the Green Deal spillover effects. Um, and you know, uh, in this region often when we talk about energy, we talk about Nord Stream 2 or Gazprom or energy cutoffs, leverage. This is a different conversation, uh, looking at a more broader range for the future. To look at the potential spillover effects of the Green Deal, the Green Deal itself, the potential for economic supercharging of the European economy, uh, the impact of the, of the upcoming COP26 on uh, the development of, our, uh, of an effective response to climate change. And to discuss all of these issues, we've got a really excellent panel of three speakers. First of all, we've got Valadis Domorovsk, the, um, uh, the Vice President of the European Commission, charged with dealing with these issues, David Moran, the UK COP26 Regional Ambassador, and Nick Reckman from Oxford Analytica. So we've got a really excellent panel, and hopefully we're going to have a really, really positive discussion, and, and ideally we'd like to get the audience involved as well. Now, what we're going to do, I think, here is very simple, is that I'm going to ask the three speakers to open with uh, initial comments, five or ten minutes, and then we'll try to go into a bit of, uh, of a, a debate, and then we'll open it to the floor. So without further ado, Mr. Vice President, if you'd like to start. Well, uh, good afternoon, uh, everyone. Well, first of all, um, uh, thank you very much for this invitation to speak at the uh, Riga uh, conference. Well, uh, maybe uh, let me uh, start with a, a general point on the European uh, Green uh, Deal, because uh, indeed it's uh, something which will determine uh, our policies in uh, coming years and uh, probably even decades. We have set the goal for climate neutrality as of uh, the came with substantially uh, more ambitious emission reduction targets for so 55% uh, emission reduction uh, target. Uh, we are dev devoting very uh, substantial financial resources for those uh, goals. Uh, uh, so if you look at the EU's uh, multi-annual budget from 2021 to 2027, it's 30%, which must be devoted to the uh, 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 issues related with the climate change. And if you look uh, specifically at European Economic Recovery Plan, recovery and resilience facility. It's 37% uh, of recovery and resilience facility which, which must be uh, devoted to climate related uh, issues. So uh, indeed it's going to be uh, one of the EU's uh, flagship policies. So where do you think the, I mean one of the issues is, is that there is simply the scale of the capital which is going to have to be mobilized for uh, the um, for the transformation, so one of the questions I think is 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 to start with is simply the the sheer um, uh, amount of capital and how 
the union can help mobilize their capital? That's one of the questions that, that immediately struck, struck me to, uh, in this. And how easy do you think that's going to be? Because, I mean, the, the numbers, I mean, one of the numbers I, I picked out of this, when you look at it in some detail, is an extra 380 billion euro a year. And that's quite a lot of ca extra cash just for the union. Uh, well, uh, indeed, uh, uh, the estimates of uh, uh, necessary uh, 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 financing which is uh, uh, needed to reach the targets of European Green Deal are indeed uh, very uh, high. Uh, well, those uh, uh, vary depending how you look, but indeed we are talking about a uh, uh, few uh, hundreds of billions of uh, euros of additional uh, mm -hmm. investment which is uh, uh, needed per year over the next uh, uh, decade. So uh, public financing will do its uh, part. I already mentioned uh, how much of the EU budget is devoted to those uh, goals. Of course, uh, EU member states are doing their part with the green budgeting, with other initiatives. But it will be private uh, 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 finance, private sector, which will help to provide the scale. Mm -hmm. And that's why already since 2018, we are working on EU uh, sustainable finance uh, strategy and uh, action plan to ensure that we can steer private finance to those green and sustainable goals. Uh, for this, investors need uh, uh, clarity on uh, what they are investing. So we are uh, uh, developing, we developed the uh, EU taxonomy or classification system of green financial activities, which is the world's first classification system of this uh, kind. Uh, we uh, uh, adjusted reporting requirements to provide uh, both the information on how climate change affects uh, companies' uh, finances, uh, what financial risks uh, it presents, uh, and uh, also, uh, also uh, how, uh, in turn, companies' actions are affecting uh, uh, climate and uh, environment. Uh, we uh, 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 provide uh, information and uh, 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 inquire about the priorities of sustainability preferences of uh, investors when they are investing in different economic activities. European financial institutions are setting up their uh, strategies in line with the targets of European uh, Green Deal. One can talk about uh, a European Investment Bank, European Bank of Reconstruction of uh, Development. Uh, we have uh, a sustainable Europe investment plan with a plan financing of 1 uh, trillion euros so there are many uh, initiatives, but indeed, the scale of transformation is very uh, substantial. So it will require mobilization both of uh, public and private finance. Yeah, I think part of the key is, is, is that it's going to be a public-private partnership because the state and the union on its own, the institutions cannot possibly uh, bring this into operation. And I, and I suppose part of it is also to do with that the, you need a lot of uh, new market mechanisms which will actually probably be created actually by the banks, by the financial institutions to channel capital, and where the union will actually not necessarily play, play their principal role. Uh, well, uh, 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 indeed, if you look of, of one of the EU uh, financial instruments in West EU, mm. uh, it acts exactly in, in line with this logic, which basically it helps to uh, the risk uh, to the extent uh, investment for a private uh, sector with some kind of a forced, uh, first loss uh, absorption guarantees and other elements. And so we can use a limited amount of uh, uh, public finance to uh, crowd uh, in uh, substantially higher amounts of uh, private uh, finance. That's exactly the logic of uh, uh, InvestEU, how it's working, and it's uh, uh, actually, uh, uh, substantial part of the sustainable uh, investment uh, Europe plan, which I, uh, 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 which I just uh, uh, mentioned. That's, that's really interesting and quite helpful. Um, perhaps, David, of course, we look at it more broadly. We've got the, kind of the COP26 upcoming mm -hmm. and the potential to kickstart a lot of initiatives okay. um, and to push forward the agenda. And, of course, the, the UK as the host is leading on a lot of this. And uh, perhaps you could give us your kind of initial observations on and context and, and as to how we should, we should now proceed. Well, th thank you very much. Um, 
It is indeed very close to Glasgow. It's a little over uh, a couple of weeks now, and uh, it, it might be helpful to uh, offer a little bit of, of context in which the, the uh, EU Green Deal will, uh, uh, will be operating uh, in, in the near future, and uh, Glasgow, of course, uh, the outcome of Glasgow uh, provides the framework, hopefully, in which uh, the EU climate ambition and global climate climate and will uh, operate for, for years. Uh, it's as, uh, as uh, newspapers have been saying all over the world, this is the, the best chance we, we have to keep uh, global, uh, average global temperatures under control in the long term. And that requires uh, immediate action as the uh, very stark warnings in the IPCC report uh, pointed out. Uh, finding that the world is indeed warming much uh, faster than we uh, anticipated and uh, that there is no alternative to immediate action if we want to avoid the uh, catastrophic multiplier effect of uh, the extreme weather events we're already seeing at the, at the moment. Uh, the EU, uh, for, from the UK president point of view, the EU's ambition, as showcased in the Green, t uh, Green Deal and the Fit for 55 package, is extremely welcome, because we'll need leadership from, uh, from everyone, but uh, uh, major players like uh, the EU and, and uh, including the member states uh, are going to be ab absolutely critical if we're to be uh, close to where we need to be uh, at Glasgow. And so the, uh, the, the 55 by 2030 uh, commitment is, is very positive. Uh, that said, uh, and there's no doubt that significant progress has been made uh, in, the, in the last couple of years. I think countries, countries uh, when we took up the presidency preparation role in 2019, Countries with net zero targets accounted for about 30% of, of uh, global GDP. That's now up to 80%. But recent analyses from the UN and the IEA uh, show quite clearly that the short-term commitments, the 2030 commitments that have been made um, up until the end of July at least, are insufficient. The IEA, I said, uh, I think, just said recently that um, if those commitments are implemented, they will only reduce uh, emissions by 40% of what we need to uh, get carbon neutrality by uh, 2050. So that's um, it, it begs the question: Where are we for Glasgow? Uh, now, there have been some significant uh, commitments since then, and I know that the way of things at international summits like Glasgow is we can expect a lot of heads of states and government to save their announcement for, for the moment on the, on the stage. And all I can say is I, I, uh, I hope that the collective, um, uh, the, the, the collective action which is announced uh, at Glasgow is sufficient to uh, address what uh, the science says uh, is needed. And it's quite clear what, what we want as, as the UK presidency. We will be brokering the highest possible level of ambition. We've got no interest in a lower mm. common, a lowest common denominator role. Uh, mm. But it is a consensus uh, a framework and so the only way that we're going to get uh, a package at uh, Glasgow which um, uh, which is ambitious enough is to have uh, spent the time up to the end of, of, of the summit listening uh, and, uh, and, and, and coming up with a package which is just and inclusive and and uh, enjoys the support of every single country. And I think we all have a role to play in making that conversation uh, work. Uh, I, I totally agree that Glasgow isn't just an environmental summit. It's very much an 
economic summit, it's a social summit, it's a gender summit, it's a security summit. And, and uh, more than that, it's, it's how we, we are going to live our lives from this point on summit. Uh, so, you know, long advocated the mainstreaming of uh, climate policies into uh, the, the, the policies that, um, uh, that we're undertaking for uh, COVID recovery, uh, economic and, and social and security factors as well. And this is where um, a framework like uh, the Green Deal, a holistic approach like the Green Deal, uh, comes in because uh, you, you, have to, you have to look at it from all angles. Uh, Glasgow's going to uh, experience, I mean, <laughs> intense scrutiny. And it already is facing it. And uh, that's great because uh, the larger the conversation, mm -hmm. the better the solution. And it involves uh, participants from business, from civil society, from youth groups, uh, and, uh, and individuals. And uh, they all have much to contribute, including through their own net zero targets. Uh, we've boiled, because it's so broad, uh, the UK president has boiled the main areas of, of climate work down to three. Uh, one is the mitigation area, the, 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 the cutting of emissions and speeding of the energy transition from fossil fuels to, uh, to renewables. Uh, adaptation, the protection of, of nature and uh, vulnerable communities. And then, uh, as we've been talking about, unlocking uh, climate finance uh, for, for developing countries in particular. Uh, most, it's clear, most of the money will come from private sources, but it can certainly be stimulated and encouraged by public, uh, uh, public commitments as well. And some of that is uh, public climate finance commitments. The, the commitment that we made at Copenhagen collectively uh, way back when of $100 billion per year for, for climate finance has yet to be met. Uh, and uh, I'm hoping that at Glasgow we will be as close as possible uh, to that, that goal. Probably not meet it this time, but maybe in next year. So as uh, much of the Green Deal aligns with all of this, boosting renewables, binding targets for reducing energy use, phasing out uh, internal uh, combustion engines by 2035. That's, that's all uh, really useful. Um, but uh, as it evolves, uh, the Fit for 55 package uh, goes through the consultative legislative processes, then um, uh, in, international partners will, will, of course, be watching. Uh, but whatever the, the results, it's clear that it sends uh, a signal of intent, uh, which is important both within and beyond the EU. And I'll just uh, end up these initial remarks by saying uh, the UK presidency starts in November, so we, we have a whole year of follow-up before we pass the baton to uh, the, the uh, presidency for COP27. Uh, so there will be opportunities for us to, to work together uh, with uh, Europe uh, on climate uh, action. But most immediately, uh, our objective is to get the 197 delegations to do enough uh, to uh, protect the planet and uh, leave, uh, leave the environment in a fit condition for future generations. That's a really great opening uh, uh, comment uh, to give a kind of broad ambition we've got here. One of the, the thoughts which immediately struck me was, uh, uh, as you were speaking, was the, one of the difficulties, surely, is uh, with a lot of developing countries. Whilst it's not focused, uh, a lot of the commitments are actually focused on, developing, uh, on developed countries. The, I think part of the issue is, is that whilst you can see that one of the positive spiller effects, if the developed economies do a lot of the investment, they make all the change, they create all the, 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 the real, the real uh, if you like, push. Mm. There can be positive economic spillover effects mm. in developing countries. But also, there's also the question of how do developing countries really access the, uh, the new technologies? Uh, 
Mm. And how are the how do they because the, the problem with all of this is it's all great. It'll work in the West. It'll work in China. It'll work in a, in the EU and the US. But the cost of that technology, that being able to change. Mm. And so I, that creates a question in terms of consensus amongst all the 196 states mm -hmm. of how far we are able to provide them with both the economic regulatory and technology transfer um, support, which would be, and how, 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 much, how key do you think that is in the, in the development of the... Oh, it's, it's absolutely key. The, I mean, two of the three areas that I went through, the adaptation no. uh, to help... Well, all of us, it's not just developing countries who are, of mm. course, uh, affected by climate impacts, yeah. but uh, help all of us to uh, adapt and, and indeed prosper yeah. in the face of climate change. Yeah. And uh, the climate uh, finance one uh, is, uh, they're, they're essential yeah. parts of the deal. Mm -hmm. I mean, you won't, you won't get that climate ambition mm. from them on, in terms of cutting uh, emissions and accelerating mm. their energy transition if they can't afford it, yeah. if they can't see a way through, if they don't have the technology or the financial or technical needs. So part of, part of the Glasgow package and part of our broader work beyond yeah. COP26 is, is to make sure that uh, all of the initiatives, mm. all of the networks, all of the processes that exist mm. Um, uh, including mainstreaming through uh, multilateral uh, institutions such as the World Bank, uh, are used to help create uh, a, 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 a climate action framework which works for developing countries as well as for us. Yeah. And, and it, it, it's, a, it's hard graft, but yeah. it has to be done. Yeah, that's, that's, a, that's a very good point. Now, perhaps switching to uh, our... Uh, esteemed economist with his potential skeptical eye on all of this. Is it deliverable? Can we do this? What do we do? So I leave it to the skeptical economist to give his view now. Nick, over to you. Thank you, Alan. I thought initially I might make some remarks about um, uh, the Green New Deal's uh, impact on the EU's place in the world. Um, but it, it comes onto this, and I think you've raised a very important point just then with regard to uh, developing world. So one of the positives, this is um, a big, ambitious, comprehensive plan. And EU has done more than any other region in the world to actually cut emissions over the last, last 10 years or so. So there's a first mover advantage that counts double there in terms of EU going out into the world and, and, and trying to encourage others to follow some of the steps that it's taken. But when we look at the Green New Deal, I think there are a few aspects of it that it seemed to me could be problematic as EU goes out and tries to, to spread the message. And the first one is actually around this uh, net zero 2050 uh, target, which is of course one that's been adopted by many advanced states. Now, the rationale behind that is obviously a good one, the idea we should all drive to this target as soon as possible. But if you sit in India, you see things rather differently. The Indians will tell you that they have much lower per capita CO2 emissions than Europe or the United States does, and that their cumulative emissions since the industrial age are much, much lower. So we know that there is a finite amount of carbon which we can put into the atmosphere without threatening that temperature target. The Indian's argument is most of that carbon budget belongs to developing countries. It belongs to India, it belongs to Indonesia. And actually by adopting a 2050 net zero target, rich states are actually taking more of that budget than would, is just under a historical, uh, under a historical uh, perspective. So that's the first thing. So how the Green New Deal is communicated, how NAP 2050 is communicated, is going to be a very sensitive issue in parts of the developing world. That's the first point. Second, um, there are aspects of, of the Green New Deal I think are going to be contentious. Uh, I'm thinking particularly of the carbon border adjustment mechanism that I was suspecting may, may have come up earlier in conversation, but hasn't. So this is basically a carbon tax at the border that covers goods which are covered by the EU's own emissions trading scheme so that you can't get carbon, carbon leakage, so that foreign producers won't have unfair advantages within the EU market. But it is going to be highly contentious. It's going to look like a protectionist measure at a time when the EU is, uh, is trying to retool itself to many countries. It has a clearly extraterritorial element to it of the EU trying to push its standards on there. One of the 
one of the rationales behind the uh, carbon border adjustment mechanism is that it will encourage other countries to start their own carbon markets if they haven't already. That's the sort of aspect that when you see it with US uh, sanctions, um, extraterritoriality is one thing that tends to set other countries on edge. It looks like an intrusion into their, into their sovereignty. So again, I think this is something that has to be quite carefully managed. I also wonder if it's gameable. The EU might hope that the carbon border adjustment mechanism is actually going to encourage other countries to cut their carbon, but maybe what they could do if it's a fairly large uh, conglomerate that you're looking at, they could simply have their lowest carbon plant geared towards uh, exporting to the EU and then the rest of their, the rest of their industry would, uh, would, would lag somewhere behind. So CBAM, I think, is, is an issue. And then there are two aspects within um, uh, the taxonomy that uh, the uh, Commissioner Dombrovskis I mentioned that I think are, are, are quite interesting. One is, one is biomass and the fact that the EU does not uh, regards biomass as, as carbon neutral. Um, the science around this is quite contested, Alan, um, yeah. because the carbon that you emit by burning wood pellets is not immediately sequestered into woods that are replanted. It suddenly takes years and decades. And if we only have 20 odd years left to get to these targets, then that's, that's certainly problematic. Uh, my worry here is more than anything that the EU sticking to a fairly expansive definition of biomass and it's acceptable is going to set a bad example for other countries. One of which, by the way, is the United Kingdom, um, but Korea, Japan are also places that are quite um, biomass uh, fixed. Um, other aspect of this is whether nuclear power counts or not. Uh, this is an issue that divides the member states. Uh, we're yet to see whether nuclear is in the taxon taxonomy. My own view is that nuclear is going to have to be part of the mix if the world is going to get there. You know, India is, uh, generates 70% of its, of its electricity by burning coal. Um, the idea that you can use wind or solar to fully cover that gap, it seems to me, is a bit of a push. And it's also a great opportunity for Europe, because if you're looking at Europe's place in the world, when Europe goes out into the world, Europe actually has nuclear technology. It has a fantastic scientific base. So this is an area where Europe can compete with the United States. It can compete with Russia. Uh, when China gets more into the game, it can compete with China too. And if you're looking for something that is a strategic export, then this is it. I mean, beyond arms, nuclear power is just about one of the best ones. You really take a partner seriously if they're helping you to keep your lights on and also to take your own country up, up the scientific knowledge tree. So I think that's an excellent one uh, there. So let's look at some of how some of these issues briefly might, might impact on a country uh, which is a partner of, of the EU in terms of the Green New Deal. So let's take Russia. Um, Russia is a country that for many years has held two contradictory and not very helpful ideas on climate change. Firstly, that the whole thing was a Western plot designed simply to deprive Russia of, of the fruits of its natural resources and export them so much. And at the same time, if it were to be true, it's not something that Russia should really worry about because it would open up the Northern Sea Route and it would open much more Russian land to agriculture so it would be one of the net beneficiaries. Um, that idea, I think, is, is now both those ideas have lost a lot of ground. And President Putin actually put climate as one of the priorities in his federal address in April this year. Um, Russians accept now that uh, there are effects at home and abroad climate change. At home, got um, the melting of the permafrost is causing some quite serious losses for oil and gas. And that's something that causes Russia. It's also uh, causes concern for Russians' leaders. It's also something that is uh, visiting terrible harm on Russia's infrastructure and, and the cost of that. Um, beyond this immediate term, also in the south of Russia, we have the potential of more droughts, uh, more dry seasons and, and, and extreme weather that is going to disrupt a, a lot of life. And then abroad, obviously, the effects are equally significant. We're talking about uh, the shriveling away of Russia's major exports, oil and gas. Uh, we're talking about carbon taxes, heavy carbon taxes on some other really big Russian exports, steel, aluminium, fertilizer, petrochemicals, uh, among, among them. So it's highly significant. And on top of that, Russian companies, of course, the ones that are plumbed into the financial system are exposed to the whole range of exposures of ESG. So for Russia, this is a big deal. I think Putin has finally signaled belatedly that Russia is going to have to uh, take some action on this. Russian companies already are beginning to wonder how they can handle this new external environment because the EU is a very important, um, uh, it's a gravitational force in that way 
for a lot of, of Russian industry. So I think ultimately they probably will play along with it. Um, Russia still has sufficient um, incentive to do so. So one of the questions is, can they put a mix of hydrogen and methane into those gas pipelines to help Europe uh, solve out its energy problems um, when, the, when the gas sort of goes away? Obviously, there'll be more of a pivot to Asia within this, but that's, that, will, that will be not marginal. Um, so I think the prospects are, are reasonable that actually this is going to have some positive impact on Russia, but it's not going to be a very easy process to manage because, as you know, um, Russia is not a country that particularly enjoys it when it perceives that the Europeans are trying uh, uh, to tell Russia how to uh, act, um, how to arrange itself domestically. And these are some things that, um, uh, that inevitably are touching on very sensitive areas. W one final figure for May Allen, just on... on um, perhaps I think the most revolutionary aspect of the Green New Deal, and that's the circular economy. Um, uh, if we think that uh, an electricity system powered by wind and solar and with our cars running off electricity is a real game changer, then it, it pales in comparison to what the circular economy might do. The idea that we move away from, not just in the, in the interest of, of um, improving the, uh, uh, the climate, but, but more generally to sort of heal the earth that we go from uh, consuming resources, making goods, and then using them, throwing them away. But we go to a system whereby everything is designed at the start to be repaired, reused, remanufactured is a huge change. Imagine that your smartphone is one you have for life and it's renovated along the way. You don't buy one every two or three years and then throw it onto your children. The changes, if this actually were to properly bed in to our economies, to our lives, to the prices of goods, to the patterns of consumption will be absolutely enormous. Um, and so I, I'm only beginning to start to get my head around what a big change that would be if it really uh, gained traction. Nick, that's very interesting. And I think you kind of underline the scale of what uh, we're trying to do here. I mean, it is not a, it is not a small thing. It is not a simply about putting up a few windmills and a, and a few solar panels. The order of magnitude of change is far greater than I think most people appreciate. Um, I was wondering, um, Mr. Vice President, what you think about this, this, this broader issue about cooperation with energy partners like Russia, when they may well actually be seeing their... Um, you know, we're doing this green deal. Uh, we can see the fantastic spillover effects. And the, the best example I can give of that is probably electric vehicles. I mean, I think this is one of the areas where we will probably see a lot of success relatively quickly with the rollout of those. We you know vehicle transport in Europe is about 6 million barrels a day of consumption. That's about a third of all the 19 million barrels a day we, we use. I mean, if we basically move rapidly in the direction of electric vehicles, uh, you know, you can see that you know, the Russians may find it quite uh, sort of threatening. That's 40 to 50 percent of federal tax revenue from the, the oil revenues, which, which, which we're putting under threat. And if we're doing it, the Americans are doing it, the Chinese are doing it, all more or less at the same time, driven by COP26. We can, we can see that, that that's, that's an issue for them. And also, it kind of is an issue for us, because surely, you know, they are to our east, and to our south, we have Saudi Arabia. And so we literally have, we, we're, we're solving our climate, perhaps solving our climate problems, but we're actually then resulting in significant geostrategic problems to our east and to our south. And I, I wonder what you have, any, any observation or thought about that? Uh, well, yeah, uh, thank you. And actually, there were uh, a lot of uh, issues and points uh, raised, so let me maybe uh, come back uh, yeah. uh, to some of them. Yeah. Uh, so first, uh, uh, it's uh, worth noting that EU is uh, emitting around 8% uh, of the global greenhouse gases. Mm -hmm. So obviously, if we want to deal with uh, uh, climate change, it's a planetary uh, uh, challenge. And uh, other countries, which are uh, all in all uh, uh, amount to 92% of global emissions, must also do their uh, part. Uh, there is uh, clearly a historical uh, aspect of uh, developed uh, countries versus uh, developing countries and how much emissions there had been uh, historically accumulated. Uh, and I think that's uh, also one of the reasons behind uh, this uh, uh, climate pledge of uh, uh, developed uh, countries, 100 billion euros uh, pledge, and actually recently both EU 
and U.S. have stepped up their financing towards this uh, uh, climate pledge to uh, support uh, developing uh, countries in uh, climate uh, mitigation and adaptation. Mm -hmm. So uh, clearly this is uh, something which we also need uh, to uh, factor in. Uh, then uh, some points were raised, uh, for example, on carbon border adjustment mechanism. Well, when uh, designing carbon border adjustment mechanism, we were uh, very careful to make sure that it's in line with the uh, uh, rules of the World Trade uh, Organization, uh, that uh, we are not discriminating uh, uh, versus uh, non-EU uh, uh, producers. So basically for energy intensive sectors like uh, uh, steel and al al aluminum, fertilizers, electricity, uh, cement, uh, when we are starting to put uh, carbon price for the EU industries, uh, of course, there is a risk of carbon leakage. So in a sense, we are offsetting it with a, a carbon border adjustment mechanism, but we are doing it, uh, so to say, in parallel. As we are phasing in carbon price for our industry, we are phasing in uh, uh, CBAM, so at no point providing, so to say, double protection for the EU uh, 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 industry. And uh, we are ready to offset uh, any uh, price of uh, carbon, for example, which is put on uh, producers on, uh, uh, in the third country. So in a sense, if uh, the price on carbon in the third country is uh, equivalent to the carbon price in the EU, in this case, uh, there is no uh, CBAM to be uh, paid. So it's clearly an uh, environmental measure to uh, protect uh, ourselves against the uh, risk of uh, carbon uh, leakage. Uh, then as uh, a question on uh, on russia on uh, 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 i would say uh, in in general on uh, oil exporting uh, countries uh, clearly as we uh, transition towards uh, uh, carbon neutrality we'll be phasing out uh, uh, fossil uh, fuels and it's uh, uh, going to be the issue and we know that actually many of the oil exporting countries are already uh, working on the diversification of their economies. And it must be said it's not only the issue uh, outside the EU, it's also an issue within the EU. We, for example, have uh, quite a few coal regions, and as we'll be phasing out coal, of course, we need to uh, support also those uh, uh, regions and, and people in those uh, regions. And that's where, for example, EU's uh, just transition mechanism and just transition fund uh, comes uh, in. So obviously, it's going to be a a major uh, transformation and there is going to be a cost of action both within the EU and uh, outside the EU uh, but it's also clear that the cost of inaction is actually much uh, graver uh, mm -hmm. for the entire world. Sorry, David, do you want to come in? Yeah, yes, just uh, if I may on, on uh, two or three of the points which, which have come up in that uh, the 2050 uh, date, of course, uh, reflects uh, the scientific uh, requirements for it, and uh, the, slight, uh, the, the slight risk of going uh, significantly slower is that we end up having to uh, achieve our net uh, zero neutrality by 2045, which is um, instead of 50, uh, in order to keep the, the, the temperatures under control. So, I mean. It, uh, although uh, th there, is, uh, there is a challenge for uh, developing countries uh, outside, uh, outside of Europe, certainly to, um, uh, to, to meet some of these demands. Some of them have uh, settled for 2060 or, or, or even closer. Uh, but uh, whatever, they, they, I mean, in general, they're going to need every bit of the support that, that's out there. And Russia, which I had, uh, um, uh, I, I had the chance to visit in, in June, um, has, has been, I, th I think, uh, their, their thoughts on uh, climate change and climate action have been evolving over the past uh, two years. And I think one of the factors, uh, one of the drivers is in fact opportunities, economic opportunities. You know, there, there are a lot of people, not just in the oil and gas, sectors, but other uh, sectors of Russian uh, industry and innovation are, are focused on uh, the, the opportunities and uh, that, there's a positive motivation as, as well. And then I'm, I'm glad you mentioned coal because coal is one of mm -hmm. uh, the star candidates uh, for, for publicity at, at Glasgow. Glasgow is the, uh, the meeting that we want to uh, reach agreement for phase-out dates for coal for almost every, uh, every coal-producing nation. 
uh, and that, that will be a major focal point. Uh, so, but, and as, as the Commissioner rightly says, uh, it, it's uh, not straightforward. You have, to, you have to take into account the social dimensions and integrate that aspect uh, into the implementation of that uh, phase-out process. Um, Nick, I was wondering, uh, if I can come back to Nick for a second, uh, you, the, one of the points you made was about nuclear, and I was wondering, obviously there's a, there's a debate going on uh, about the, the role of nuclear and financing it and so forth, but one of the questions I have got, which I don't quite understand myself, is if we are going to reach 50% uh, cut in emissions by, uh, uh, by 2030 on a 1990 basis, which is what the plan and the Green Deal is, you, the question I have got is with what are we going to reach that target? Because, I mean, I can see that the things might work in the future, hydrogen or whatever, but in terms of if you're going to hit a target in 2030, sh beyond nuclear, what is there? I mean, renewables can play a significant role, but they can't do the heavy lifting. That's what my, my impression is. What's your view on this? Um, <clears throat> well, I, I'm with you, Alan. I think that need, probably nuclear needs to be part of the, the conversation. And uh, I think President Macron probably is the one who has grasped the future of his uh, announcement. <laughs> this week. The question is, um, how many bets on human ingenuity do you want to make? So um, let's say that renewables, we can achieve this from what is already a fairly high base, or at least a respectable base, a five-fold expansion in renewable generating capacity in Europe. Can we do that given uh, the supply chain constraints we've already got, given that CBAM is actually going to increase the price of steel and cement that we're going to need to build some of those wind turbines? Um, it seems to me that nuclear really has to be part of, of that mix if we are to get there. But the, the transition challenge is far bigger than simply the electricity sector. We need to see big changes in industry, in agriculture, uh, in transport, as we know, electrification of, of, uh, of, of cars and, and, and lorries on the road. And uh, residential and commercial buildings as well. So yeah, it's absolutely enormous. But uh, and, and so I, I think it's important that we acknowledge the scale of the challenge in the, in the energy in the electricity sector. But don't think that that is all the game because it really isn't. My understanding of the argument is partly that the reason why electrical power is so important is that if you if you are able to zero carbon electrical power then you can confidently electrify the economy and electrification then becomes a means of decarbonisation. I think that's, that is understanding is why is, I think there's so much focus on it. We're quite right. I was quite surprised when I was reading all these documents about agriculture, how far, you know, agriculture <laughs> is a CO2 yeah. fest, yeah. essentially, and also on that construction and so forth. So, uh, yeah, Mr. Vice President, I don't want to put you wholly on the spot, but nuclear. <laughs> mm -hmm. <laughs> well, uh, what do you think? I mean, it, it is, I mean, there is this question, and I put this to a lot of my green friends. I say, Yes, if it's a climate emergency, then yes, do we, what do we do? Do we take the view, a bit like with the vaccine production, that we've got a whole series of options, one of which is this nuclear option, and then we look at everything else, and we don't, we don't stop at nuclear, we put our, a lot of R&D into lots of other alternatives. But if we're going to get there fast, what do we do? That's my question. Mm -hmm. Yeah, uh, well, uh, as regards the uh, role of uh, nuclear in this uh, transition to the uh, climate neutrality, the uh, European Commission is uh, continuing to uh, assess this uh, question uh, because uh, it's uh, uh, clear that we need to uh, recognize the role of nuclear as a uh, low carbon uh, energy source. Uh, we also uh, need uh, to recognize the role of uh, uh, natural gas as a transition energy uh, so we are working uh, currently on those uh, issues uh, well in uh, case of nuclear there were also uh, several uh, scientific uh, reports which uh, were uh, recently uh, made so we're looking also on this uh, do no significant harm criteria mm -hmm. so when we're assessing uh, uh, different uh, well sources of uh, energy we are assessing not only their carbon footprint but also 
uh, how they fit into do no significant uh, harm uh, criteria, where obviously there are questions related to uh, nuclear waste and its long-term uh, storage. But it's uh, something which is currently uh, 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 under assessment uh, in the uh, Commission, uh, because indeed we need uh, not uh, only to think uh, how, in a sense, uh, 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 things uh, will uh, look uh, uh, at the end of the day, but how we also get there and where uh, nuclear and natural gas will also have a role uh, to play. So I don't know if you have any uh, uh, further observations on the, the, this kind of either the nuclear, nuclear thing or, or perhaps CBAM. Do would you, would you have any? Uh, not, not so much on those, but I wanted to say that I, I uh, agree with Nick that there's, there's a whole broader agenda in terms of decarbonizing cities, uh, building efficiency, et cetera. That, that, that is very important, and I think it falls, un it falls under the pillar of mitigation, yeah. I, I think. And th those, those are, I mean, getting that right, uh, taking cities, for example, mm -hmm. uh, is an immensely powerful way to make a uh, contribution. Same with sustainable agriculture. So, you know, investing time and, and money in, mm. in those areas uh, as well. Uh, it's just, we, it shouldn't be instead of the headline uh, campaigns in terms of, of uh, lowering the amount of carbon. Mm -hmm. So uh, there's, there's a whole sort of pie chart of, of uh, factors and issues that, uh, that, mm. that we can go through. Uh, pretty much all of which um, uh, are, are valid parts of, of the, the package of, of um, effectively yeah. combating climate change. Yeah, it's such a big, uh, big, it's such a big package in so many That's different right. parts. That's right. Nick, I just wanted to come back to you about this issue you were saying about India taking the view that if there's a carbon budget, it belongs to the developing world. I mean, the, the problem with that is that does that also put a kind of uh, pressure on the developing world, on the, on the developed world, to, send, uh, to, uh, to, to sort out its CO2 uh, emissions issues much, much, much faster, and puts a premium not necessarily in nuclear, but looking at ways of finding alternative sources of power which are not CO2 emitting uh, sooner rather than later. And there is a kind of, there's a, there's a kind of almost, but a political, but also perhaps a creative tension here, which will play a, a, a significant role. Mm. Mm. Yes. Um, ultimately, it's going to be a question of money, I think, Alan. Technological transfer and, and financial transfer. Now, the promises that were made um, at Paris for $100 billion a year of technology transfer uh, to developing world haven't been made. Um, you know, the, it's very difficult to get good estimates on that, but there was a World Bank one that I think came for the 2019 number being maybe 80 billion rather than 100 billion. Um, and almost certainly the, you know, the price tag is sort of going up year by year by year. So um, part of the, I mean, a country like India is not really prepared to be uh, constrained in its growth potential as none of our countries were previously. Yeah. simply because of a problem which actually is largely of, of the West's making. So it's not the case that the Indians are not prepared to come to the table, but the kind of offer, I think, has to be right there. And they're not interested yeah, in, uh, in tying their hands uh, for a problem which, as they see, is not, is not wholly of, of their making. And so that I think that the technology transfer is going to be very important. Mm -hmm. It seems to me nuclear really has to be uh, part of the mix. Southeast Asia has no nuclear power plants today, uh, mm -hmm. none. Indonesia will probably get there first. We'll see some floating platforms in the Sea of Java. Um, but as I say, it's, it's an area where Europe potentially can play a role. There are more nuclear reactors operating today in Belgium, Czech Republic, Sweden, and Spain than there are in all of India. And compare the population uh, of, those two, of those two groups. So I think it's, it is an opportunity for Europe if Europe can actually resolve its, its internal divisions on that subject, which is... Uh, why well, the commissioner had to be uh, so very careful in his answer to your previous question. <laughs> so that, that's quite interesting. And I can see perhaps Mr. Macron seeing a potential monumental export opportunity for the French nuclear industry, if for no one else. So that's, that's <laughs> not to Australia. <laughs> well, perhaps not to Australia. <laughs> yes, that's another question. But I, I think there is a, 
with that, I, don't want to, I don't want to focus too much on, on nuclear, but I, I think the, 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 the broader issues about the spillover effects are, I actually think, really interesting. And I wanted, one of the areas which I mentioned briefly before was about electro vehicles, and there is, it seems to me that's one of the, one of the underlying questions is about maintaining public support. And I think, and obviously there are difficulties, you know, there's a prospect of uh, a lot of power being more expensive and more difficult. But it surely is, and this is one of the questions I, I perhaps put to the commissioner, is that is this a way of actually, electric vehicles is a way of obtaining public support in the sense that we believe by about 2025, the cost of electric vehicles will fall below that of an internal combustion engines. So you can get a cheaper car, which is cost of running is lower, no CO2 emissions, and the result in, your, in the streets and cities of Europe is that air quality improves, uh, and of course you have low levels, lower levels of noise. So is, this, is perhaps electric vehicles one of the ways of actually significantly building public support for the Green Deal in the short run as one of the, short, one, one of the relatively low-hanging fruit between now and 2030? Uh, well, uh, indeed, uh, uh, there is a, uh, a lot of work now going on uh, in the EU uh, on the movement towards uh, electromobility. Uh, uh, already uh, uh, now, uh, for example, uh, uh, there is substantial funding going, including through the recovery and resilience facility, uh, towards rolling out electromobility, uh, rolling out the network of uh, electrical uh, charging uh, stations on the roads, uh, uh, some countries uh, are uh, considering providing some uh, support for actually uh, purchasing uh, electrical uh, vehicles. And as of uh, 2030, uh, the plan is that uh, there would be uh, uh, no uh, new uh, vehicles uh, allowed for sale in the EU, which are uh, uh, not zero tailpipe emission uh, vehicles, which basically leaves uh, electrical vehicles or uh, uh, hydrogen uh, uh, vehicles as well mm -hmm. currently yeah. available uh, options. So uh, indeed, uh, the move to, uh, towards electromobility will be uh, very much uh, part of the solution, and you already outlined very well the potential benefits of that. Yeah, and I think I was just—I mean, I was just wondering again. This, this brings us to the to the broader COP issue mm -hmm. here: is in terms of building public support globally. I mean, is this about Western technology transfer? Mm -hmm in relation to electric vehicles, providing support to bring them out. And you can see, if we're talking about India and the carbon budget, if you've got the you know, heavily polluted Indian cities and you can change that, so that's great for the population. It's great for the government. They look fantastic. We, you can see a whole, re, a whole stack of very, very positive wins. And that may well be a way of helping build consensus at, at, at COP26. Uh, yeah, it, it's certainly a, a major... Um, a, a major area of work that we want to press at COP26, yeah. uh, and, and including through um, statements that leaders can sign up to. Yeah. So, you know, it, it's going to have a high profile for, for a lot of these reasons. I mean, it's absolutely right that the conditions need to, to be right to make it work with the, uh, the broader infrastructure, the, the charging infrastructure, and the support for individuals. But the, the, the economic uh, relative costs uh, are changing so quickly that it becomes viable, I think, in many places uh, uh, faster than, uh, than many people in the public expect. Mm -hmm. So it is an area to, to be uh, prepared to act, and uh, where we can, act now. Yeah. I think Act Now is, is, is the kind of, the, the, if you're almost like the motto of COP26, is it not? <laughs> Indeed. It is. Um, we've only got about five minutes left, and I, perhaps the easy thing would be to simply go around and sort of ask each of the uh, panellists, you know, what is the kind of key Green Deal achieve, uh, 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 achievable point we should be looking at for the next year? What is the thing which will perhaps make, make the most significant difference to achieve uh, the, the, the sort of cl climate goals we have. And perhaps I could start with Nick. <laughs> Thank you. Uh, so um, I think getting the carbon price, I think it, the key to it is going to be getting the carbon price high enough so that it hurts, it works. Uh, so you actually create the incentives to change and you create the the profit structures to make it worthwhile. I mean, we're talking about huge um, 
amount of money that need to go into carbon sinks, you know, need to pay for reforesting. That only works if the carbon price is right. So on the one hand, we have to make it hurt to make it work. But on the other hand, we have to not stress the tolerance of European publics and European businesses beyond breaking point. So that's a really, you know, it's a, it's a high wire act, fine line that has to be trodden. And sorry, only other thing to say is on electrification of, of transport. Remember, this requires enormous, enormous investments into the electricity grid. It's not only a case of retooling that grid so it's feeding in from renewables rather than from gas from coal fired plants. It's also the fact that on top of all the existing electricity demand, you're now going to have to deal with the entire road fleet as well. Mm -hmm. So it's a really big, I mean, the, the win win that you were suggesting was a great one, but the investments, again, are really staggering to get there. Yeah, that's good. I suppose what you're really saying is that uh, this is the climate change, climate change equivalent of no pain, no gain. As, uh, as, but it's true about the scale. It's the scale. So I don't know. <laughs> so turning to you, do you think, Dave, that what do you think is the, um, uh, what is the kind of the, the, the thing we really have to go for, for well, um, if you choose one thing? I would say this, wouldn't I? Um, but coal. I, I yeah. would say, uh, m making a real difference in terms of tackling coal and addressing the, the social aspects uh, creates, uh, creates a sort of impact which we need uh, if, if we're going to have the, the size of impact, that if we have uh, fast movement to our goals. So that, that's, that's an answer in a European context, but also in a much wider context and uh, I'm, I must say I'm working with uh, a lot of countries uh, within and beyond Europe on mm. precisely this issue. Yeah. Thank you very much. And fi the final word to Mr. Vice President. Uh, well, uh, first uh, thing uh, I would say it's not to be uh, discouraged by the scale and uh, complexity of the task because we are discussing here and we will listen to all the complexity, all the issues uh, one can even get, uh, uh, really get uh, discouraged. But we need to start uh, moving uh, forward, like every long journey starts with the first step. Probably will not get everything right with the first goal. We'll mm -hmm. have to adjust our approach as we are moving uh, forward. But it's important that we, we are uh, moving uh, forward. And a second aspect, I am uh, glad uh, also both other speakers uh, mentioned, it's a social aspect. Uh, they will be only successful with the goals of European Green Deal if we will do in a way that it's uh, socially acceptable, uh, uh, in a way that leaves no one behind. So we must pay uh, utmost attention to this. Well, on that positive note, uh, I think we conclude and I have perhaps a, a reasonable round of applause for, for, for a very interesting and stimulating panel. Okay. Right. And I think we actually have another panel now, so but hold on. <laughs> but we're leaving the stage. Okay, thanks very much. Thank you. Um, good afternoon, everyone. Um, my name is uh, Tuoms Rostoks, and uh, I'm uh, Associate Professor at the University of Latvia and a Senior Researcher at the Center for Security and Strategic Research at the National Defense Academy uh, of Latvia. And uh, today I have the pleasure uh, to interview James Apaturai. I hope I did not mispronounce Perfect. too much your surname. <laughs> uh, uh, James is Deputy Assistant Secretary General uh, for Emerging Security Challenges at NATO. And uh, obviously we'll be discussing these emerging security threats and uh, challenges uh, for the next 25 minutes uh, or so. And uh, I know that many of our uh, listeners, uh, many in our audience, they, uh, they already must know what, uh, what uh, at least some of these emergent uh, threats uh, are about. But uh, at the same time, there, uh, there seem to be quite a few of them. They've been called in different, na uh, different ways, uh, different terminology has been used. Uh, and they've been around for a while, so some of them are no longer kind of emerging. <laughs> Perhaps they've already emerged, right? So can you talk a little bit about um, these uh, emerging security threats and uh, how NATO 
could address them? Sure, and first, thank you very much for the opportunity uh, to be here and also to talk about these issues because I think most people uh, around the alliance and outside of NATO understand the sort of traditional roles that NATO has played over the, the decades. Collective defense, heavy metal, force-on-force uh, -on -force defense, or uh, the operational roles that NATO has played around uh, the world or in, in other parts of the world, and our partnerships, the sort of cooperative security element of what NATO has done for so many years. What we have over the past few years started to come to grips with is, I think you're quite right to ask the question, emerging or emerged uh, security challenges. And they're not totally unrelated to the other things that NATO does, but uh, they are growing in certainly level of concern, uh, growing in level of impact, growing in level of investment. So it, it's everybody's definition, everyone's got their own definition of what's included, but let me give you an example from my own perspective because just six weeks ago I started in this new role and then maybe it's worth laying out what the uh, different areas are under my responsibility or in the responsibility of my division because that's one way of looking at it. So one of those and one of the most prominent is innovation or what you might call emerging and disruptive technology. So what does that mean? It means artificial intelligence, it means big, big data, it means autonomous weapons, hypersonics, uh, what's going on in space. So there's a whole innovation aspect to this. And, and just to say a couple of words on that, I'm sure we can discuss it more in detail. But the bottom line is we have to maintain our edge in this area, including because uh, countries that are less friendly towards us are investing very heavily in these areas. And that doesn't mean they necessarily pose a direct military threat to us. But there is potentially a military threat. There is also a more systemic threat about governance, about who dominates in these fields which affect the security of our populations. So, you know, I say and we say to maintain our edge. And in some areas, we do have an edge. To be very honest, I sometimes wonder whether in other areas related to this innovation uh, aspect, we don't have it anymore and we need to get it back. So that's one aspect. A second one, which is very much linked to that is, of course, cybersecurity. And here I think what you said about emerging versus emerged is pretty clear. Uh, this is clearly uh, an emerged security challenge, but it evolves very, very quickly. And for example, what we see more and more is what is called ransomware uh, attacks. So attacks by private uh, groups or private groups that have implicit support from nations uh, are taking hostage major infrastructure like the pipelines on the eastern United States but uh, the United States just revealed that um, there were major attacks across their infrastructure yesterday they just announced it again this is happening all the time hospitals uh, etc so Cybersecurity is a second uh, very, very important element of our, uh, or another uh, emerging uh, security challenge. Then something which relates very much to what we've been talking about here at the conference, which is the security implications of climate change. Uh, and they are growing and they're growing pretty fast. Uh, so what do I mean? I mean, for example, uh, that there will be wars over resources. There will be mass movement of populations. Our coasts are increasingly going to be underwater, and that has great implications, not just for military facilities, but for people, because most people live near water. Uh, so what's going to happen? And what are the security implications of all of that? Uh, then from a more military point of view, of course, our militaries are going to have to participate in responding to disasters, and they're going to have to operate in extreme weather, like extreme heat. So that's the third uh, emerging security challenge. Let me give you a fourth and then I'll stop. And it's what we call hybrid. Uh, so this is also going to be discussed here extensively at the, at the conference. But what we call hybrid means that a state, in this case, an adversarial state, uses all the tools of state power 
in a coordinated way to achieve its strategic aims. And when I say state power, I don't just mean military state power, but cyber attacks, disinformation, uh, energy cutoffs, or as is being experienced in this region, uh, migrants are being weaponized, uh, but all for specific strategic aims. Uh, and according to well-developed strategies, often linked to military tools. So we need to get better at seeing what the patterns are, anticipating what they are, and responding, both in terms of increased resilience, but also in terms of imposing costs to deter future attacks. So these are just a few examples of what it is that we're dealing with, and I hope that that's enough to uh, at least begin to answer the question. Yes. Uh, thank you for the, for the answer. Earlier today during the conference, Mark Leonard uh, from uh, uh, European Council on Foreign Relations uh, mentioned that in Europe we've been uh, doing things at our own pace, but um, it seems that these security challenges, these emerging ones, they move at a, at a higher pace, uh, uh, at a faster pace. Uh, do you think that there, there is a way for NATO member states to kind of um, react more swiftly. And um, uh, has NATO moved beyond, um, let's say, consulting uh, and discussing the, these new security threats and uh, kind of moving into more tangible um, uh, policies that uh, and developing instruments because NATO prides itself upon being alliance that does things that has capabilities so when it comes to these new emerging threats um, has NATO moved beyond this discussion phase so absolutely and actually I, I I'll say very honestly arriving in my new division I was really gratified to see that in all of these areas there are substantial new policy foundations and actions being taken. But let me give you a, a concrete example because I really agree with you that we need to operate faster and in new ways. And this is l very much the discussion I've been just having in the last couple of days. And the example I want to give is uh, with regard to uh, emerging and disruptive technologies. So we have a gap compared to other countries. And one of the gaps that we have is that Traditional defense industry works well with the government. I don't have a particular issue with that. It can always be better, but it works. But where we have a gap is connecting startups and dual-use technologies to the world of defense requirements. They, uh, the startups in general in the West, don't think about defense requirements. They aren't well-versed in how to protect what they have against acquisition by others. There's often a financing gap because they need funds quickly. And you know, often there's, uh, for example, a Chinese company with a big check uh, that's ready to provide funding for them. Uh, so we are not moving as quickly as we can in adapting dual use technologies to defense requirements at the pace that others are. And as a result if we keep going like this we're going to get left behind and the traditional way that we do business which is very slow setting requirements waiting till those requirements are set then going to the companies then waiting three or four years it's not going to work we need to engage with these communities we need to guide them fast we need to give them rapid contracts uh, we need to adjust quickly on the fly, very rare in defense contracting, and we need to get those dual US technologies where they are useful for us quickly into the hands of our operators and adopting new technologies fast. So it's disruptive in the way that NATO does business. So that's the imperative and the logic and we're acting on it. So we're putting in place something we call DIANA, that's our acronym for it. But in essence, it's going to be a network of test centers, accelerator networks, bringing together startups with defense requirements, with some trusted funding to get this thing moving uh, in the right direction. But it is not easy uh, to get it moving because while everyone recognizes the importance of doing it, and everyone recognizes 
uh, that it needs to be done fast, we haven't had the procedures in place. So we're getting there, and I think you'll see at the Defense Ministerial next week, concrete achievement in getting this thing done. So yes, the answer is we are acting on it, but you're also right, it's really hard. Then a follow-up question uh, on this would be that NATO as this traditional defense alliance uh, moves beyond its traditional role. So you have to work with other actors. Obviously, you have to work more closely with the EU, but then you have to work uh, also with the, with the private sector, uh, with, uh, with business companies. So um, is it easy to work with them? <laughs> so let me put it this way. Uh, I think when it comes to the European Union, cooperation with the EU in the area, for example, of innovation, has been and remains pretty good. When we have political complications between NATO and the European Union, which anyone who follows the two organizations will be familiar with, but there is clearly a synergy and we're making sure that as we design this disruptive way forward in innovation, we're designing it with the EU's own systems in mind so that they are coherent, potentially complementary, uh, like very specifically we are doing this. So I think that actually with, in the case of the European Union, it's okay. With the private sector, uh, we're just getting going. I mean, there has been, I think, over the past decade or so, and in particular in, in some companies, a reluctance on, part of, on some of the staff to engage too much with the defense sector. And you know, we have to contrast this with, for example, the Chinese, what's called civil military fusion, where by law, every country, every company has to make available dual use technologies to the um, People's Liberation Army of China. And by law, every country that processes data has to make that data available to the Chinese government. So we're really in a very different position. And while we want the, and are designing the ethical use of these uh, technologies, and we'll make that public as well, we also can't get too far behind, which means engaging with these uh, communities. So some companies are very comfortable working with the defense establishment. Others are just unfamiliar with us. And we need an active program to get out there and meet with them, explain what our requirements are, but also warn them about keeping their technology secure. Even if they don't work with us, not to let them leach out elsewhere unintentionally. So there's a whole education program uh, that needs to happen. Many countries do it. Germany does it. My own country, Canada, does it. So there's an education aspect of that. But then the final point I would make is, and this is speaking very personally, I think we do need to be more vocal in making the point that there is a certain amount of strategic competition going on between the democratic community and the non-democratic community. And from my point of view, the companies that are based in the democratic world need to step up and not only think about paychecks, also think about the freedom of information, the standards of democracy and human rights, which we all understand now tech can support or repress. And it can repress it through the use of facial recognition technology and artificial intelligence and cameras everywhere. And feeding that is not a good idea. So uh, I hope that we can contribute to a dialogue with the private sector that also brings them on board, not just for money, but in the context of strategic competition. Um. Next year, NATO will probably adopt the uh, new strategic concept. So what place for these uh, emerging threats and disruptive technologies you see in that, uh, in that concept? So that's a great question. And we're just starting to, to develop it. Personally, and this is not self-serving, I hope for my new job, but I actually really do expect that the emerging security challenges will certainly play a much more prominent role than they did in the previous one, uh, but that was 10 years ago. Um, and I think more prominently, even in terms of proportion with the other roles. And I, I'm quite confident that NATO's three core tasks will be prominently 
in the new strategic concept as well. Uh, collective defense, our operations, our partnerships, cooperative security, these are primordial for the alliance. Resilience runs through all of those. It runs very much through the emerging and disruptive technologies uh, front in particular, but more broadly as well. So it's hard to say how the balance will come out, but it will be much more prominent. I also expect climate uh, and the security implications of climate change to be prominently in the strategic concept. It is now, I think, everywhere. The understanding that this is a challenge we all have to face has become mainstreamed. I know the Secretary General is committed to this issue personally, also because he's had a past in the climate role, but because he obviously recognizes that NATO needs to be a world leader in three areas. One is in assessing the security implications of climate change. So we need to analyze what's happening, but also what's going to happen and how to deal with it. Second, in adapting uh, to it. So adapting our forces, what they do and how they do it. And then third, NATO also has to contribute towards uh, net zero in 2050. So we have to find a way to measure the carbon emissions of the entire NATO ecosystem and then see how we can start to bring it down. So in all of those areas, I think you'll see the summit uh, will recognize uh, emerging security challenges much, much more prominently than in the past. Yes, discussions on climate change have really evolved over the past 15 to 20 years. I think back then people thought that, well, towards the end of the 21st century, we'll see some real climate change impact while we're seeing it uh, practically uh, every year on, on grand scale in very damaging uh, ways. So, there, so the, this is a different world uh, in a way, in that sense. But uh, at the end of this uh, discussion, I'd like to ask you a question uh, about um, something that might be important for, uh, for young people, uh, students, uh, young professionals who are at the start of their uh, career. Um, in terms of knowledge and skill set that they might find useful, you've had a long and distinguished career at NATO. Um, having been at NATO for, I think, something like 20 years, what, uh, what could you suggest to the, uh, to the younger part of our audience? Well, um, that's a great question, and I now recognize how long I've been there. I, I would say two things. Um, one is, with regard to what we've been talking about, uh, we are now hiring on a constant basis, of course, uh, at NATO. And in these areas of emerging challenges, we have huge requirements. For example, when it comes to expertise on artificial intelligence, when it comes to expertise on big data exploitation, uh, these are areas where it's very, very difficult to find enough trained people and let me be very honest, uh, enough trained people who are willing to work for a NATO salary because, uh, you know, I had a conversation with the head of a very, very big Canadian tech firm. This was before I took this job. And he said, yeah, James, that's great. But anyone you can hire, I can pay them 10 times the salary. And, and that's a reality. So we need people who, not are, who are not just trained, but who are committed to the larger issue. NATO doesn't pay that badly. But um, I, I would certainly say that these areas of more technical expertise are in huge demand also uh, for NATO. But the second thing I would say is, and this is much more related to the broader uh, issue of working in, uh, in NATO, and I think in diplomacy more broadly, uh, being able to write clearly, succinctly, politically to the point is actually a skill you train for. Uh, and I can see from different countries whether or not they train uh, their young people for that when I see the results that we get from job applications. But actually in any field, being able to analyze and write clearly is something which I would certainly recommend that colleagues train for. And then if you do want to get into a job in diplomacy, uh, I'll, I'll give you just my own experience. I, I did a double 
major, as we say in Canada, so I studied two things, uh, political science and history. And what I expected was that the political science would be very useful and the history would be a nice thing. In fact, my experience is the history we use every single day, or I do, uh, because actually everything is about what came before. And when it comes to understanding any country, you have to understand what came before. And that has been extremely useful. The political science theories uh, that I spent four years learning have almost never proven to be useful, so I just leave that to colleagues. Uh, but, um, but certainly when it comes now much more concretely to, to getting a job, certainly in the division where I work now, uh, the, the technical capabilities relating to uh, emerging and disruptive technologies, understanding them and putting them into a political context, that's something we need very much and I'm 100% sure we're going to need it again. And let me add also expertise on climate. This is a technical issue, it is not just a political issue. We have expertise on this, which we, uh, we need more of. Well, thank you for sharing your thoughts on this, although I thought I, almost, I would almost faint when you said that political science theories are <laughs> that so useful. Sorry. <laughs> having uh, having a, a PhD in political science. <laughs> oh, no. I almost, uh, almost <laughs> fell off the chair. Yeah, but I have a master's too. <laughs> <laughs> um, well, in any case, well, thank you so much uh, for, uh, for this uh, conversation uh, and um, uh, I suppose that we'll hear uh, a lot more about uh, emerging technologies and uh, disruptions uh, in, the, in the coming years as well and hopefully NATO will come up with, uh, with means how to, uh, not to, not just to survive but also to thrive in this uh, competitive international environment. So, thank you. Thank you very much.
go into in, in, in greater depth. This uh, session is entitled, What is the Future of NATO Under the New Strategic Concept? Now, I'm going to set the team a challenge. Uh, I am, for better or worse, a fan of Sheffield United Football Club, the mighty blades in the championship. We are a very cohesive team, but we're also rubbish because we haven't got the capabilities, we haven't got the players. And I wonder, as we move into this next decade with the NATO 2030 agenda, that we are entering what is seriously an inflection point of power. And that NATO, if it's going to meet the challenge of that power, will have to be adapted to meet the defense and deterrence challenge, as well as the stability challenge that's coming our way. And much of that challenge will be European. Make no mistake, much of that challenge will be European. So I suppose my question that I'm posing implicitly is this. If defense and deterrence and NATO's commitment to the South are to be credible, what does the strategic concept have to do to ensure that NATO stays in the Premier League today, the coming decade, 2030 and beyond? Because decisions we make now will resonate into the 2030s. And as I said in a recent speech at NATO HQ, I think there's a good chance that the next 10 years could see 70 years of defense technological change crammed into it, the equivalent thereof. So this is going to be a very, very important strategic concept indeed. Now to address the question of what is the future of NATO under this strategic concept, I have three extremely distinguished guests who are here on the platform with me right now. And one, I hope, is a virtual presence. Uh, Baiba Braze is an old friend, Assistant Secretary General for Public Diplomacy uh, at NATO. You will all know here of this parish. Uh, Ambassador Tomasz Szatkowski is the permanent rep representative of Poland for North Atlantic Council. And Eric's appeared. Eric Bradberg has appeared uh, with us. He is the director of the Europe program for the Carnegie Endowment for Peace. The way I'm going to play this is five minutes each for our speakers in the order of the program, but then I'm going to reach out to you. I want more interaction from the floor. Uh, two things to say on that. There are two microphones you can see at either end of the stage. If you have a question, come up to the microphones, because we can't, for COVID reasons, hand around the microphone as in the past. And can I again draw your attention to the hashtag RigaConf2021 if you have a question you wish to pose uh, through social media. So without further ado, five minutes, Fiverr, please. Thank you very much. And uh, Lavaka Riga, uh, good evening, everyone. First, my thank you to LATO, Latvian Transatlantic Organization, whom I helped to establish quite a long time ago and who was member number one, I still am, and I'm very proud of that. I also thank the Latvian government, not only for supporting this conference, but we being among the exclusive club of 2% of, the, of, of those spending 2% of defense and even more this year, uh, as is Poland and the other Baltic states. On the strategic concept and the very pointed questions that uh, you put to us, uh, Julian, uh, I think we all have to look really at the strategic level at that. This is not the annual communique or once in two years a communique which says a lot at you know, where allies politically uh, sort of decide that they are at that very moment. In the same time, when you look through the communiques of the year, you will see the accumulation of the change that NATO has gone through. You will see the really enormous change since 2010 where the previous strategic concept was adopted. So obviously that is what the next strategic con concept will attempt to do, which will be to capture the collective will of the allies based on the assessment, the common assessment of strategic environments, the threats, and decide where the adaptation of NATO as political military alliance should go to. So this is no doubt gonna be a big discussion, a very important discussion, both on the political but also on the military side. 
and it will deal with the core tasks that we have them now, which is currently the collective defense crisis management and cooperative security. Do they change? Whether they should change, if they change, how? There are several challenges, and the, the, what we know is that uh, the big changes that have taken place, the biggest defense and deterrence uh, adjustment has taken place since the end of the Cold War. The uh, NATO allies, more than half of the NATO allies, are present uh, in the northeast borders of the alliance to very physically ensure the, the uh, sort of collective nature of that will to defer to deter and defend if necessary. Uh, we have two new domains that have been included in all our uh, operations, planning, thinking, exercising, which is space and, and cyber. We have new policies in place on emerging disruptive technologies, the artificial intelligence, uh, the autonomy, the quantum, the, the robotics. It's, it's all taking place as we speak. Of course, for the future, the decision making at the speed of relevance, both on the, on the political and military side, will be crucial. The readiness in, that is based on awareness. So again, investment in uh, ISR, in indications, warnings, in understanding this commonality of the threat and the ability to respond. And of course, <laughs> The whole resilience of the societies, it's not going to be governments who need to respond. It's the whole society. When we look at the private sector, we already know that most of the cyber attacks are responded to on the private sector side. They are the first that experience sometimes pretty brutal, brutal attacks. And they are tested day and every day. So the same with the, with the uh, civil society, with every one of us. So the resilience in that respect will be crucial and that will, there is no one uh, sort of scenario that fits all, both in terms of the organization of resilience, in terms of, of uh, how we as societies uh, respond and how we as, society, as societies prepare. So in that respect, uh, indeed the communality of values, the cooperation internationally with the partners, like-minded partners, whether it's understanding what China is doing. And of course, we know that China is a big discussion and you have seen that the last communique has pretty strong language in that respect. That is a change from the previous communique. So um, we, we will uh, discuss and we will adjust and we will plan for the future. That is no doubt. And there are several, several elements in that. Thank you, Barbara. Wonderfully disciplined. I can see the, the headline in the press now, the new NATO whole of society strategic partnership. It's, uh, it's got a ring to it. Eric, five minutes, please. Well, thank you so much, Julian, and thank you for letting me be with you virtually from Washington. Um, and I think what I'll do is maybe try to give a bit of a perspective from how the strategic concept looks from Washington and how the Biden administration is thinking. I mean, look, I mean, I think, you know, as, as Baiba correctly mentioned, you know, this is a big deal. The last strategic concept from Lisbon in 2010 you know, it's really was outdated even, you know, maybe by 2014 by Crimea and kind of lacked strategic focus. And as Baiba mentioned, so much has changed since then with, with the U.S. Uh, shifting its attention to the Indo-Pacific, the rise of China, a more aggressive Russia in Europe's neighborhood, an unstable neighborhood, increased, you know, cyber hybrid threats, new technologies, and so on and so forth. So it's really about defining, I think, NATO's role in an era of strategic competition and clarifying its what priorities and capabilities it should have, and then how to bring all the allies on board with kind of a roadmap for implementation. And I think this is really what Biden wants to do. He wants to, you know, he's talking about rebuilding and reinventing alliances, but I think he sees the strategic concept as a way to get European allies themselves to understand why they need to invest in their own security and defense and resilience. Um, and that's why the, the strategic concept cannot just be, you know, lowest common denominator again. It really needs to bring both, I think, unity and cohesion, certainly, you know, post the experience we had with, with President Trump, but also, you know, more recently, post Afghanistan, post AUKUS, and amid a lot of other divisions among NATO allies. But then it also needs to, I think, provide a real strategic framework for the alliance, kind of like the national security strategy here in the United States, which then, you know, informs defense planning. I think that's really the purpose of, of the strategic concept as well, to kind of inform what the next capabilities should 
goals should be after 2024 and, and as we look ahead towards the next decade. So I think from a Washington perspective, you know, they're very big expectations. Um, and I think there's a lot at stake. Um, and what we're, you know, I think the jury's still out, um, but, you know, it, 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 it's an opportunity. Um, and I'll come back. I have some other ideas in terms of what the challenges and priorities will be, but I'll happy to come back to that and, and, and hear what the other panelists have to say as well. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you, Eric. I, 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 that's a very great way to put it, a sort of NATO security strategy. Because so many countries are producing national security strategies these days in which they do match assessment with capability. And it strikes me that this strategic concept, that's the test that is essentially going to have to pass. Tomas. Thank you, Julian, and uh, really delighted to be, to be here uh, in Riga. Always uh, happy to come. I have a lot of friends here, and if, even if it's uh, the price of an early flight, which I really hate. But it's, um, again, uh, uh, and kind of comfortable to speak after such um, uh, eloquent um, uh, predecessors. And uh, this allows me to pick on some uh, of the themes. I think that the future of the strategic concept need could be uh, encapsulated to, to uh, the uh, f future setting of core tasks of the alliance indeed. And from the Polish perspective, this is very much about restoring the centrality of the collective defense as the core mission of the alliance. And uh, from that perspective, we should uh, not treat the, the current formulation of three core tasks as some, some sort of a dogma after all they've been um, adopted uh, in 2010 in a very peculiar geopolitical situation. And I would even argue that perhaps it wasn't uh, ever uh, up to date even at that moment since in 2010 we were already after certain aggressive uh, actions uh, that were conducted by, by uh, Russia. And yet this was the least defense heavy strategic concept out of any that Alliance had adopted. So it's about the continuity. It's about and from that continuity to perspective of 70 years of the alliance, actually, the, one could say that 1999 and 2010 were some sort, some sort of a, actually disruption rather than um, trend uh, setters. I know this is a bit controversial, but still, I, I would like to uh, sort of uh, throw that into a, a debate. Then the future of the crisis management. And uh, again, I mean, uh, from Polish perspective, we would like the alliance to we like the alliance to be the pre, prime military security and defense organization for the political west so that means that we don't want to do away with, with other sort of security related tasks but again it should be uh, the collective defense in the first place because in, this is the most ambitious of the, of the, of the core task and then of course we should find a way uh, and a will to do uh, to address other security challenges that are connected to, for instance, the crisis management. But again, here the Afghanistan and the lessons learned will bring us some answers. And uh, I think that we should be more realistic and pragmatic in addressing, in ad addressing those kinds of uh, challenges, uh, sort of stabilization challenges. Uh, um, lastly, partnerships. Uh, I think we are in a, in, a, in a completely different environment. Just recall the, the wording on, uh, on, on Russia from the, from the last strategy concept. We need to take stock uh, of that. That doesn't mean that we should be closing doors to Russia, but again, I mean, we are in, in, a, in a different environment. Also resilience, I mean, because yeah. perhaps, I mean, this should, I mean, one could have a debate whether, whether we should le have less core task or, or more. And, and resilience is, is a very important tool. Uh, connected to collective defense, but possibly also connected to other challenges coming from other ge geopolitical directions, like, for instance, China. And this is going to be, be, be another big debate in the context of this tragic uh, concept. Thank you, Tomasz. I'm, I'm going to open the floor now, but I just want to, 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 to put a question into the air. All of this has got to happen in the context of the post-COVID economy. Um, and what I'm hearing is capabilities, capabilities, capabilities. It has to be paid for. So think about that and how are we going to, to achieve those ends given the economic reality. I'm going to invite first uh, an old uh, friend of mine, uh, Ian Brzezinski, to, to, to ask a question. Are you going to ask a question, sir, as well? Followed by that gentleman behind. Ian, please come to this microphone here. Yep. Thank you, Julian. It's good to see some old friends. And uh, I guess since I just got off the, the plane, I'm a little bit cranky. So let me ask come this on. question. You know, what is, why was NATO created? 
uh, what's its primary mission? And its primary mission is to throw lead downrange. That's why it won the Cold War. That's why it was effective deterring war. That's why it's been operationally effective in Afghanistan. And that's what we want it to do. Uh, when I think about strategy documents from the United States, we have our national security strategy that Eric talked about. We also have our NDS, our national defense strategy. It strikes me that we really want the NATO strategic concept to really be akin to a national defense strategy by a national security strategy. Because when I look at the evolution of strategic concepts, they become increasingly more and more like a smorgasbord of a variety of issues that kind of dilute the focus and attention on the core mission, throwing lead down range, developing war fighting cap capacities for whatever, high intensity warfare, counterterrorism, what, what, be it, what be it. So I want to ask you all, will this strategic concept be different? Will it, should it be different and return back to that core focus on actual military war fighting skills and capabilities that need to be brought to bear and kind of stay away from things that really don't fall into NATO's domain? Thank you, Ian. You're always cranky, mate, so don't worry about it. Um, <laughs> let me go in reverse order here. Tomas. Thank you, uh, Julian, and um, very good question by, uh, by Ian. But uh, let me address also your first, uh, some of your first remarks. You've, you've mentioned uh, cohesion, and I think you've mentioned a, a technological change to the battlefield. And let me be a little bit co uh, contrarian. Uh, here, I think this is uh, because I think you wanted to get across the change and sort of the, the, yeah. the cohesion will not su suffice. I think that in terms of the capabilities, um, I think uh, we can achieve a lot by cohesion and consistency. I think we've got a lot of capabilities here in Europe and it's about actually harnessing them better for the goals of the Alliance. What has cr over 20 years of crisis management operation done to us it's actually that uh, we've detached the great majority of our forces from NATO planning, force structure, and exercises, and we need to re re sort of restore that connection. So this is about uh, cohesion in, 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 some, in some way. Can it's I also, jump in there, Tomasz? Does that mean the strategic concept should be more like flexible response in 1967 than, say, 2010 Lisbon? And, uh, and uh, very much, I, I, I think it also brings us, uh, this to, to, to Ian's question. Indeed. There's been an evolu evolution of, of strategic concepts that have become more and more politically, uh, politically sort of, sort of uh, de develop um, the documents. Uh, and I'm, I think this one should, and I think it will be more um, of a military nature, not exclusively military nature. Yeah. Of course, we need to um, uh, understand the p political environment. We, we need to bring uh, all our allies on board. But what is different right now? I mean, we've recognized the threat. And for um, a couple of years now, the Alliance uh, has, again, military strategy and other do documents that stem from that, other concepts that, that stem from that. So, I mean, it's actually difficult to imagine, but for almost 20 years, the Alliance uh, operated without the military strategy. It was a kind of an ad hoc military organization rather than a cohesive one. So we are in a different situation and a new strategic concept should take stock of that and should, should recognize it. Thank you. Eric, Sure. You respond to that question? Yeah, it's a, it's a great question, Ian. And of course, I mean, I, I think we should be wary of mission creep and thinking that NATO can do everything. I do think, you know, as been mentioned, the core task for, you know, for NATO needs to be deterrence and, and collective defense of, of Europe on the eastern flank. That's very clear. Uh, but I do think NATO can play a role um, when it comes to projecting regional stability in its neighborhood. It may not always be NATO as an alliance, as an organization. It may be flexible coalitions operating with US or, or NATO support, but I think there's certainly a role for NATO there. And as also been mentioned, I think there is a role for NATO on on resilience, um, you know, working alongside the European Union, for instance, on resilience issues within Europe, but also on projecting those in the neighborhood in ways that actually serves, I think, the, 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 that works alongside the, the uh, deterrence and kind of more, more military aspects of what NATO is doing on the eastern flank to, to essentially deter uh, Russia. So I think that's actually is very complementary. Where I do think we should, you know, the strategic concept needs to be very clear is about NATO's role in the Indo-Pacific. And I think we've, we've had this debate now post-AUKUS. I'm very concerned that 
NATO should play, you know, the notion that NATO should play a military role in the in the Pacific. I think that is stretching our resources way too thin. Um, that said, you know, I do think that NATO can play a role in terms of partnerships with Indo-Pacific partners, and maybe especially on some of those resilience issues, um, where where NATO can be a platform for for engaging on things like you know 5G, 6G standards, uh, the whole issue about tech and and supply chain. Uh, decoupling issues related to China, sharing information, sharing intelligence, uh, participating in training, those kind of things. But that's, I think, is very different from playing a military role in the Indo-Pacific. And we should be wary, I think, of, of doing that. Because I think, you know, to your point, Ian, I think, you know, if defense planners are looking to the NATO strategic concept for guidance, I think it would send very confusing signals if, if a priority is, you know, NATO playing a role in the Indo-Pacific in terms of then informing European countries what capabilities they should be they should be you know developing and that's why having the the priorities i think very clear uh, is so important and and that's what the strategic concept needs to deliver on thank you eric uh, don't worry we brits are it's called AUKUS. um Baiba. um jan welcome welcome to riga uh, good to see you here the um, the question is very pertinent obviously you know what type of document are we going to have and, and there were classified strategic concepts, there have been now open public documents, so it will be an expression of 30 allied collective, collective will. It will be created by all 30 together. So it's, it's, I'm not uh, currently saying what type of document, but it has to be very clear enough and strategic enough for the military to take guidance and to be able to inter interpret that for their planning and everything. And as Thomas said, of course, we have the whole set of documents in, in force that, uh, as we speak, also you know, are, are forming the basis of action, what we do. Quite clearly, when we compare to when the alliance was established, and it's, it's very interesting to reread uh, the 1947, 48, and 49 uh, papers of the time. You have to remember that it was not uh, an alliance as we see it now. It was very much against Germany, actually. The, it was Germany who, that was the sort of external challenger at the time, still, uh, when uh, you read the protocols. So uh, in that respect, of course, the alliance has adopted and we will adopt. It's just the reality what is happening uh, as we speak. The response measures, the awareness, so the data-enabled threats that we face don't recognize borders, that is for sure, Where, wherever they come from, that is one thing. There are uh, hard security threats, as we know. Also, we just saw how part of the territory of a country was taken away and, and uh, using all possible measures, hard, soft, hybrid, and, and, and uh, uh, whatever you can imagine. And uh, we will need to formulate those responses at 30 for our military, for our politicians, and for societies, because the response has to be and the ability to act at all levels. There is no just one response to that today, because there are threats that don't recognize the borders anymore. Thank you, Baiba. Um, I'm going to abuse my role as chairman by taking questions and then assigning them to one of my panels so we can get through as many questions as possible. Sir, please identify yourself and uh, your question, please. Yes, uh, thank you. My name is Frederick Leikvist. I'm director of something called Stockholm Center for Eastern European Studies. And I used to serve as Sweden's first ambassador for countering hybrid threats. So my question will go in the opposite direction of, of Ian's. Uh, will there and should be there a, a special place for, for hybrid threats uh, in, in, in the strategic concept? And I will explain the question a little bit because cyber is often mentioned and cyber is often mentioned as a, its own domain. But Not too long, please. Short, uh, yeah. short point. Yep. But, but hybrid threats are composite and, 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 and multifaceted. So will there be, and it's not only about resilience, it's also about situational awareness, connecting the dots and deterrence for sub-threshold uh, sub uh, threats uh, 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 non-military character. Will there be a place for that? And what's the division of labor between EU and NATO and the coordination, if there should be any, between the strategic concept and the strategic compass? Great question. Thank you very much. Thomas, you want to take that? Uh... I can try. Uh, well, uh, for, uh, when, I speak about the, uh, when I speak about the hybrid threats, I think the first thing that comes to my mind is, is that, there, again, is that there's more continuity than, than change. I mean, actually, coming from Poland again, I, in the 1920s, we used to have green... Uh, men on, on our eastern borders I and mean, actually we, we know Russian predilection towards information warfare already from I think 17th century so the, the, but just I mean technological 
reality may change, but certain concepts and approaches do not change that much. So this is, this is one. So this is also restoring uh, the alliance ability to operate throughout the continuum of peace, crisis, and war on a political and on a military level. This is, and, and, and I think new, on a military level, we, we are actually getting that right. I think it's important to be able to get that right also on a, on a political uh, level. The uh, second uh, thing is, the, is, is uh, resilience, indeed. We, we need to find a way how to provide certain uh, benchmarks uh, and how to, uh, how to sort of hold the allies ac ac accountable for, uh, for, for them. And indeed, it links us also to the NATO-EU question. Uh, I can agree with that EU has a very unique instrumentarium. Uh, and there needs to be a healthy dialogue. Poland is very much in favor of that. But I don't think this is really about functional or, or sort of a, a division debate, or this is kind of on a, on a technocratic side. It's more about certain political uh, stumbling uh, blocks uh, between so, some of the allies and, and some of the member states. And they need to be solved uh, in order for us to proceed more smoothly and, and uh, cooperate more smoothly. Thank you. I mean, I'm getting the sense that this thing is going to be as long as the Encyclopedia Britannica. There's going to be a lot of issues inside the strategic concept. So I, I pity the poor drafters. Any brief comments from my other two colleagues before we move on? Um, Fiber? Just to say is that hybrid indeed had a place both in, in, in the communiques in the last few years. So it's very difficult to imagine that suddenly the Allies would drop, yeah. would drop the whole concept of hybrid. And when we think about it, yes, we can see that there are hybrid attacks without the hard sort of element in them also in the future, but it would be difficult to imagine a hard sort of action, a kinetic action without having a hybrid yeah, element indeed, in all of them. It's, there. So it's Absolutely. just, we, Absolutely. we can't really separate that. In fact, from the early other. in the Brussels communique, it says that that previous language will be inserted in the strategic concept. Quickly, Eric, a, a point? Yeah. No, I, just to weigh in, I mean, I, th I think this is an important point because I think in the, you know, this era of great power competition that we find ourselves in, especially facing authoritarian countries like Russia and China, you know, yes, there, there's a clear, at least when it comes to NATO from Russia, a clear military threat, but, you know, we're constantly being, being under, you know, attack from various types of non-military um, ways. And I think that's really important that NATO, you know, plays a role there. I mean, you know, the, 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 the challenges that China constitutes towards NATO um, is not military and probably won't be for a long time, but, but it is a serious threat. Um, it has to do with information security. It has to do with control of infrastructure, critical infrastructure, ports. Um, it has to do with, you know, influence operations and disinformation, economic coercion. Um, maybe not all of these are areas that NATO traditionally deals with, but I do think NATO needs to play a role in addressing these issues alongside the EU, alongside other, other players, other member states. Um, because that's, that's inevitable. You can't just, you can't just uh, distinguish between military and non-military and just say that NATO is going to do the military. It needs to, do, it needs to look at this comprehensively, and hybrid is a big piece of that. Thank you. Uh, before we say too categorically about the Chinese, I've just written a big report for the European Parliament on the EU and Arctic security, and there are certain developments going on Greenland research laboratories where there are some very strange-looking Chinese scientists appearing in the uh, parts of Greenland. So I think this could come quicker than we think. Uh, first, Ben Hodges, and then I have a question from, I hope, is a young person, anonymous, from social media. Ben, please. So uh, the nature of war is constant, but the character of war obviously is changing, and, and this has been talked about uh, throughout the day, uh, which means that the requirement for SACUR to be able to identify the threats soon enough so that we can act soon enough to prevent the crisis from ever happening. Will the strategic concept give SACUR the authority to do things uh, within this uh, a new construct to prevent the crisis from ever happening? So in other words, delegating more authority to SACUR uh, so that he can act, so that he can start moving things to prevent a crisis. And in that same vein, how do we as an alliance based on collective security of its members, how do you get the initiative instead of always reacting to what the Kremlin does? How can we get the initiative uh, without being seen as overly provocative by some, uh, some members of the Alliance? Thank you, Ben. Uh, ben and I have just published with John Allen a new book for Oxford called uh, Future War and Defense of Europe, 
which is brilliant and very reasonably priced on Amazon. Um, who wants to take that? That's a fairly, I mean, that issue of delegated authority, you know, one of the issues in the book is hyperwar. And hyperwar is an accelerated warfare where you, you can't go into the kind of formal procedures. You've got to have a, a very, very rapid response mechanism. And that strikes me as a crucial challenge for the Alliance. Who wants to take Bible? You want to take that one on first? Um, I, will, I, will, I will say a few words because yeah, obviously, uh, obviously we all understand that is, again, in, yeah. the, in the data Personal enabled yeah. environment, that is the obvious question that comes to all of us. You know, what is the decision making at this age? What is the uh, sort of preemptive measures? What are the levels of, of delegations that, that are there? And not necessarily that has to be addressed in the strategic concept per se. It's a strategic level document. So there will be uh, the formulations that will allow the military to, to take uh, it further. But quite clearly, you know, speaking about the adaptation, it's not only the political adaptation, it's not only decision making, it's not only the joint intelligence sharing that we now have at NATO that has been, you know, escalated uh, after, after Ukraine to an unseen level. And, and this joint awareness and joint understanding of threats that we've been able to reach on everyday basis. Eh? But it's also really about the actual actions that then need to be taken. And, and again, it's not going to be formulated in so many words in the strategic concept, Ben, as you know, but uh, there will be, the Allies will reach a consensus on, on what we need. Indeed. For the I mean, it's, so it's, I have no doubt, you know, when you look at NATO's future, this is what we do. This I mean, it's the already Alliance. there in the de de deterrence concept and the warfighting concept. There are two other classified documents, as I understand it, that begin to address these issues, which I won't refer to. So this is going on already. There's a certain, uh, uh, NATO is aware of this challenge. Eric. I think the only thing I'll, I'll just add is, I mean, I think the, 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 the question also raised the point of sort of reacting early and early warning um, and, and NATO's institutional and decision-making setup. And I think one thing there that can be approved, uh, improved that I hope the strategic concept can at least contribute to is making NATO also more of a platform for political dialogue, not just military dialogue, because I think that, you know, in order to act early, in order to be aware of emerging uh, challenges coming at NATO, we need to talk about that. And I think if there's anything that AUKUS and Afghanistan and these crises that have, or I guess Afghanistan was a crisis, AUKUS was a diplomatic crisis perhaps. But anyway, what they, what they point to, I think, is sort of the lack of political dialogue in NATO as such. And I think that's something that needs to be strengthened and can maybe then help with sort of spotting the, the, the threats coming and, and taking more early initiative, which NATO clearly needs to do. Um, and that's why that piece needs to be strengthened and the strategic concept should at least contribute to, to making that happen. Thank you, I, and I agree with you, Eric, but I don't think the strategic concept should say everything. Uh, comprehensive political guidance, there's a whole host of other sub-documents that will come out of it. I mean, it, it begs a fundamental question, who is the audience of a strategic concept? What is it for? And I think the Alliance has to be very clear, the NAP has to be clear about what it's for and who is the audience as, as we move forward. Baiba, you want to come back briefly, then I'll just, move to talk. Just a quick two finger. I think we clearly have to understand that the nature of deterrence is, is changing. It yeah. includes, yes, nuclear. It includes, you know, conventional. It includes integrated air missile defense in that respect where we, you know, there is a whole new development there. Yeah. It, invo it involves the whole society approach. It involves the ability of the whole society to withstand and resist crisis resist Absolutely. anything. So in that respect, you know, there is, there is a, a big change happening in all our societies, yes. Yeah, absolutely right. You know, this whole hybrid warfare, cyber warfare, hyper warfare continuum, that is the continuum of deterrence as well. Tomas. Well, on, on pre-delegated uh, authority? Yeah. Well, uh, I, I, I'm absolutely on this side of the, of the debate. Uh, our, the current strategic environment uh, requires us uh, act to uh, act in a more agile way. We need to have prepared plans on the shelf, sort of uh, um, a crisis reaction measures that are, that are, that, that are prepared. Uh, of course, NACT needs to retain some political control, but it doesn't mean that we, we have to follow the current model, which is very much sort of crisis management geared with a long, cumbersome process and very much ad hoc based yeah. I mean, we, as a result of that lack of military strategy for many years. So we need to adapt for that. Indeed, there'll be 
pressure to retain political control, but it doesn't, I mean, it, it, it just cannot uh, be the stumbling uh, block for uh, execution of, uh, of our reaction. Otherwise, we will, uh, a lot of, will, 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 will just happen on, on national basis. And if allies wanna, want to sort of cohere over, over our reaction to, uh, uh, to the threat, we need to give more flexibility to the secure. And then sort of debate it, work it through within the NAC. I mean, uh, sort of prior, prior to, the, to the reaction, through plans, through, through concepts and doctrines. I mean, it strikes me that, that the, the agility of future decision making will be a key component in credible deterrence. If we haven't got it, deterrence itself is undermined as a, as a communication to an adversary. But mm -hmm. you're absolutely right. So bear with me for a second. I have a question on, uh, on the social media that I want, to do, I want to get going. The question is, the Biden-Macron joint statement finds the US as complementary to the EU. How does the panel see the new strategic concept addressing the EU-NATO relationship? Well, I'm going to go to, to Eric for that first. How does the Biden administration see it? it? It's a great question. And I think this is something that the strategic concept needs to deliver on. It's actually clarifying this kind of age-old question about what is the European pillar in NATO? What does it actually mean? Um, and what I think the concept has an opportunity to do, given, I think, the the more positive view that the Biden administration has about the European Union and NATO, which we saw both in the Biden-Macron phone call and we saw that in the EU-US joint statement from June, is to move away, I think, from what has been, unfortunately, quite a divisive debate in recent years on this whole notion of strategic autonomy. And maybe focusing less on these abstract concepts and have the strategic concept come out and actually endorse EU defense initiatives and acknowledge that they play an important role um, and, and an important complementary and compatible role to NATO. Uh, so I think that's actually really important. And then spelling out the expectations on, on European NATO allies and ways that the European Union as an entity can also contribute both to deterrence in the East in these areas that we've talked about, including hybrid, but also in crisis management in, in the neighborhood. So I think here's a, a real opportunity, but also you know, a real challenge and, and, and you know, given that there's also going to be the EU strategic compass coming out in the next few months. So making sure that these two documents are aligned, are complementary, um, is, going to be, is going to be hugely important. But I think there's an opportunity here to, to you know, move beyond this divisive debate and, and, and really move towards, you know, a, building or clarifying what a European pillar in NATO actually means. That's a good point, Eric. But I, I go back, if, if we are to make a NATO-EU relationship strategic, it's got to be built on capabilities. I mean, I fully understand there are certain complex contingencies in which you wouldn't want a NATO flag on it or a national flag on it. An EU flag would communicate a different identity. And I wonder, and I'll put this to my, my, my two colleagues here on the stage, whether we can finally get some kind of Berlin plus type arrangements properly working. Thomas, do you want to take that first? Well, I I think, you know, functionally, again, there's not really a problem to find a, very, a good solution for, a good formula for NATO-EU to, to, to cooperate, to, to, to divide labor. The problem is really uh, among, uh, I mean, the problem lies within uh, certain differences between some of the allies and some of the member states yeah. of, the, of the EU. And yeah. once that is solved, and I think, think we should really pay, the, I mean, sort of direct our efforts towards that rather than for finding new formulas that, that would allow us to go uh, around that. Because, and not really f uh, fall for the trap of the debate on strategic autonomy or European army. I think that what's below those words, I mean, actually what different actors have in mind is actually much closer when we actually talk to the French, to, the, to, to Germans, to the US, it's really indeed much more about capabilities than about creating sort of a parallel decision making uh, and command uh, structure. I would also be worried about giving too much uh, uh, sort of uh, work uh, on that to bureaucracies. I mean, bureaucracies tend to be yeah. sort of, you know, <laughs> steer themselves towards the institutional interest. Once we uh, have a healthy debate among member states and allies, I think we can end up in a, in a, in a rather healthy uh, spot. Thank you. Baiba? Um, I think that we quite clearly have recognized the US strategic partner for NATO. Yeah. That, that strategic yeah. partnership is recognized by everyone. That is uh, what we do on the basis of that. The cooperation that we have is just excellent. The unprecedented levels of exchange of information uh, daily, weekly meetings, exchanges, there's, you know, there's a very rich, <laughs> very yeah. practical cooperation. 
So I would disagree with those that try to spin some type of, you know, disagreements and, you know, buff up uh, certain, you know, total differences among the organizations. Uh, they are not really there. They are, of course, the nuances and how allies or how certain countries perceive each other, that is a different thing. But again, as among, you know, organizations to, to ensure that there is a very practical collaboration to, to resist the external threats that we recognize on both sides that uh, there exist. Uh, it, it just, we are going ahead with that. It's just, it's just working. So, um, also in my field in strategic communications, it's just everyday collaboration. Yeah, but it does, uh, I'll come back to you in a second, I'm sure. But it does strike that a strategic partnership is a two-way thing. And given the importance of NATO planning functions, harmonization of planning will be vital. But also, given that 80% of, of capabilities are now outside the EU, then surely the EU's third country arrangements need to change as well. Because the idea that major powers like the uh, UK or Turkey or, or anybody else, either the US and Canada have signed up to military mobility, do not have a say over an EU operation, effectively denies the EU that access. So I think there's a whole range of questions that are indeed still outstanding. Thomas. Just, just, just one uh, additional sentence. I, I, I would like to say that indeed there is some risk in this concept of, kind of US EU security or defense cooperation. Yeah. To us, indeed, this is NATO, which should be the platform to engage uh, EU Atlantic uh, allies over security and, and, and defense. And of course, there is a complementary role for the EU in that. But just that. Thank you. Sir, and who are you and what is your question? But, but oh, sorry, sorry. Just one you're, you're totally right, of course, investment in capabilities, and that was the same what the Prime Minister said. It's really the capabilities yeah. that matter at the end, so we need to have those, and it's secondary. You know. It's a sine qua non of all of this. Yeah, if, I, if I may come in quickly on that point, if I may, yeah. on, on EU-US defense cooperation, it's a topic that I follow, and I think it's actually, you know, I don't see it as necessarily a bad thing for NATO. I actually think there are good reasons for, given that the EU is becoming a stronger security defense actor on its own, new initiatives like PESCO, European Defense Fund, so on and so forth. Um, I think it's a good idea to have the EU as an institution talk more to Washington, including the Defense Department, which they traditionally haven't. And I think it's been positive to see the Biden administration joining PESCO, participating, you know, and I think there's more that, you know, could be, could be discussed in this context of U.S., and the EU, that doesn't really, you know, I think it's very complementary yeah. to, to, to NATO's role. So I don't see that as problematic. It's a vital issue. Absolutely right. Sir, who are you and what is your question? Uh, this is Shotak Vidnerio from Baltic Defense College. And uh, Mr. Lindley French, I hope you remember two years ago we shared the panel organized by NATO. We did, indeed. And it's the face mask. Title, and the title of that uh, panel was uh, contested territories between Russia and NATO, and we both heavily criticize that topic. So there are two components to what NATO has to be doing. One is defending its own territory, and the second is projecting security and stability outside the allied territory, right? So in this context, there has been 13 years since the Bucharest summit decision where Georgia and Ukraine were promised to become part of NATO, and there has been literally zero progress on this political integration path. Of course, there is a lot of cooperation, but on the integration path, there is no progress whatsoever. So does 2022 document somehow have a clear vision on the future of this in-between territories uh, from NATO? And uh, uh, actually, it is obvious that Russia will continue treating this in-between territories as, as its sphere of exclusive influence. We have suffered two wars since the Bucharest summit decision, so there has to be a unified vision by NATO and all the allies on the future of that uh, area. So if Thank you have you. any comments on that. Great question, and great to see you again. And I, I suppose that boils down to, is the open door still open? Who wants to lead off on? Bye, but you want to lead off on, on that? Um, that is very obvious. The open door policy is in force and it's not going to change and it was reaffirmed in the communique just a few months ago in the, in the summit. And I, the last thing I would like to Georgia identify itself on is the contested territory. Georgia is a sovereign country, a European sovereign country with strong democratic institutions that need to be still strengthened and it's doing great reforms, proud people, excellent excellent country with rich culture and bright future. 
So, you know, the last thing that, that needs is to, to actually diminish uh, that in respect. As for, the, as for the joining of NATO and whether, you know, there is a consensus among the allies for admitting, admitting the next group of aspirants, that is, that is a different question. It requires both the aspirant to be ready and for NATO to be ready, and the open door policy is and will remain in force. Tomasz. Well, uh, Poland uh, stays uh, clearly behind 2008 because some decision that Ukraine and Georgia will become uh, NATO uh, allies. Uh, of course, we have to uh, work on the sort of pragmatic conditions on that. We also work on, uh, have to work on cohesion among uh, allies. However, indeed, we cannot grant Russia NATO. In the meantime, we have to look for uh, bringing these countries closer. And I wouldn't agree that there's, I mean, nothing has been happening. For instance, Ukraine has been granted the EUP status in, the, in between. And this is something, this is the opportunity that uh, still can be harnessed, harnessed to its full um, potential. Eric. I completely agree uh, with, with what was said. I mean, I think besides keeping the open door open, um, I think NATO should continue to project security and stability to these countries that we're talking about, providing more, whether it's cybersecurity assistance or working more on the issues that we discussed earlier on hybrid or disinformation, um, you know, working alongside the EU doing all of these things to, to assist these countries become more resilient uh, against the, the pressures that we're gonna see from Russia and, and others. So I think that's really NATO's role as kind of a resilience hub and projector of stability in its region while continuing to keep the door open, of course. I have a question from social media, which I, I'm not sure, I, I'm gonna read it out, but I don't think anyone will take it. Is, does the EU US Trade and Tech Council consolidate, consolidate the status of the EU as a partner, I take it of NATO, instead of individual states, especially in emergent challenges. Does anyone want to take that? Eric? I'm not sure I fully understand the question. I think no, the, I the Transatlantic Trade and Technology Council is potentially important. We just had the first uh, leaders meeting in September. There was some progress, I think, especially on the kind of defensive technology issues, like export control, FDI screening, uh, but there's a need to do more. Um, I think this is a positive thing, because if you read a statement from the TTC, without saying so, it essentially deals with the technological challenges we're facing from China. And I think it's important to have this, um, you know, link between the US and the EU. And I think for NATO, that's good news. And I think it recognizes that, you know, um, on a lot of these, these regulatory issues, you know, it's not really NATO uh, that's the key actor in Europe, it's the EU. So having the US and the EU deal more with some of these issues on, on technology and digital issues, including dealing with disinformation and regulating social media platforms. Um, you know, I think it's, it's, it's good for NATO. And I don't think that detracts from, from NATO's role as the kind of bedrock of, of transatlantic security. On the contrary. Thank you. I'm, I'm not going to go further with that question unless there's someone. Faber, you want to jump in there? Just to say at a personal level that uh, uh, indeed the partnership that is based on values is, is very valuable. And what we see there, it deals with supply chains, yep. it deals with data tech governance, it deals with AI, it deals with a whole set of issues that we are also dealing with in NATO. So as larger the community on, on, on the basis of what we can work together in terms of, you know, uh, achieving the same uh, if not the same, but similar outcomes in terms of what we want for our security, defense, and our societies, and, and having those partnerships, uh, be it EU, US, or be it with the uh, AP4 partners or, or Georgia, Ukraine, it's, you know, it's, it's good for all of us. I mean, I would add to that that what that question hints at is a much bigger question, which is if we are to invest in the technology of future war, which is artificial intelligence, machine learning, big data analytics, drone swarms, uh, nanotechnologies. I find it hard to see how that could happen without many current export controls on both sides of the Atlantic being removed. Because there's going to have to be a much more fluid transatlantic tech exchange mm. to underpin that growth. Because I can't see the European defense and technological industrial base producing this stuff. And I think the U.S. is going to have to be willing to share black box technologies with allies that in the past it's been uncomfortable about. If, if they want the alliance to be a useful ally, and that's going to be a question for the U.S. Now, we have 10 minutes left. 
I want to finish off in reverse order. Sorry, uh, Alan, a bit late, mate. Um, by asking you a direct question, all of you. <laughs> what will NATO look like in 2030? Just how different will NATO be in 2030 compared with 2021? I'll start off with Eric. Ooh, that's, that's an easy question. It's still only morning here and I've only had one cup of coffee. But um, look, I mean, I think to me, there, there are a lot of things that will probably be different. But to me, one of the things that really needs to be different and where the strategic concept can help us get there is to really make sort of NATO more European, to have this, you know, we talked about a European pillar in NATO. I think we really need that. I mean, the US, I'm sitting in Washington. The debate here is all about China and the Indo-Pacific. I think the strategic shift to the Indo-Pacific will inform strategic attention, will inform resources that the US allocates um, away from the Middle East, as we've seen with Afghanistan and elsewhere, and away from Europe. I don't think that means, and I think we, it would be a mistake to draw the conclusion that it means that the US will disengage from Europe or you know, abandon European security. I don't think so. On the contrary, in an age of strategic competition, I think you know, having Europe remain a stable democratic ally is very important for the United States. But it does mean that I think Europe will have to take more responsibility. And I think there's greater US expectations that Europeans will do so, not only on managing instability in, 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 in you know, the European South, but also frankly, on contributing to deterrence on the Eastern flank. So a NATO that is, has, has a greater European leadership role, and that puts you know, the onus on the big three, UK, France, Germany, I think it also puts a, a burden on smaller member states to also contribute and, 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 and you know, shaping this, this European uh, pillar within NATO with US support and with US encouragement. And that's how I think we reconcile this age-old debate uh, and put it to rest. It's a stronger, more capable, more resilient Europe anchored in the transatlantic alliance. And I think that's frankly something that, you know, everyone around the table should be able to agree on at this point. Thank you, Eric. Strategic autonomy is a function of power, not words. I couldn't agree more. Thomas. Well, uh, let me tackle uh, sort of more of the defense side of it. I, I think we, we'll need to restore the capacity for the alliance to be able to tackle large scale threats coming from uh, state actors. This is, this is one. At the same time, retaining some of the uh, capabilities and functions and processes that, that we've gained over uh, 20, 30 years of uh, operations out of area, uh, tackling some of the new techn technological uh, trends, and also through the resilience lens, perhaps being a useful tool to ta tackle threats coming out of the area of responsibility of the uh, strategic uh, commander. This is also a question of economy of effort. And I see two aspects here. One is some regional fo focus will be needed in the alliance in terms of the capabilities. We have to uh, do away with the notion that everything will be, I mean, everything will have to be able to do the same in, in, in the alliance. At the same time, we have to assure that everyone has some skin in the, in the game. This, that also pertains to the to possible engagement in uh, Asia Pacific I mean, having in mind that, 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 that I mean, that there are some clearly defined boundaries of the alliance. Uh, still, I think uh, I, I think Europeans can do m more in the European uh, theatre rather than going sort of beyond beyond it. But we need to maintain cohesion and relevance also for the US uh, uh, of of NATO as the Euro-Atlantic uh, platform. Thank you, Thomas. Thank you. Fiber. It will continue to be a strong alliance, political military alliance of 30 or more allies that is able both to deter against a whole range of threats from nuclear to hybrid and also to defend if necessary. And it will have adapted to the new age uh, that we all have entered. It's simple as that. Thank you. Um... Let me conclude this excellent panel. I'm grateful to my three distinguished colleagues for giving us the very open views on, on, on the strategic concept and NATO's future. You know, NATO at the end of the day, as a citizen who pays for it, for me, is a warfighting defensive alliance that must be able to deal with the worst case that can happen. And what is the worst case that can happen? In, in the book that Ben, John Allen and I wrote, we open up with a scenario. And that is that the United States is faced with simultaneous crises in the Indo-Pacific, in the Middle East, possibly in the Arctic, and in Europe. 
and is stretched thin the world over. And in that situation, it is up to Europeans to be the credible high-end first responders to take the pressure off the United States, to keep America strong where America needs to be strong in return for the maintenance of the security guarantee to Europeans. That is, to our mind, to my mind, the future of burden sharing. And that the strategic concept must deal with this issue of burden sharing, but it must also deal with the issue of what the future war battle space will look like, the technology that's emerging and disruptive technologies that are entering the NATO, the NATO uh, uh, era and NATO arena. Now, at the core of that, I can see no real way around something that looks like what we call an Allied Command Europe heavy mobile force that is able to operate across air, sea, land, cyber, space, information, and knowledge by 2030. That could be used in various ways to support EU operations, but must be much more ambitious than a NATO response force. Readiness will be vital to this. It's not just about the forward presence. It's what's behind the forward presence to maintain deterrence. But at the same time, if we're facing simultaneous engineered crises, then we've got to have sufficient mass, not just fires, to deal with crises on our southern border. Too often when I hear the discourse about deterrence in the east and increasingly in the north, North Cape, Arctic, and in the south, it's almost as though the alliance can't agree where its center of gravity is. Now all of this, if it's going to be paid for by Europeans, will be have to be paid for in the post-COVID economy. We're not going to go down the route of European defense integration. Forget all the, 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 the talk of that. We're still a long way from having the kind of governance with, which would enable that. But my final thought, and any quick response, welcome. Do we re Europeans realize the implications of change that you've been talking about for them? Or, or is there a certain degree of denial amongst the European body politic about what will be required from we Europeans to make this work. Very quick final thoughts. Tyler. Well, actually, Tom should speak for Europeans. I'll speak for NATO. <laughs> All right. Tom? Well, uh, yeah, well, I, I, I very much agree uh, with what you have said, maybe with some uh, nuances. One is, I mean, I, I sense a certain premium on the kind of power projection mode of uh, op operating of NATO's military. No, I mean, it's, it, it's focused on it, Europe. I mean, this is what... Uh, this is what deterrence will take, yeah. defense will take. Yeah, but I'm, I, I also mentioned in my, in my previous intervention this regional focus, and it brings me down to the, the some level of specialization that will be needed among, among Europeans. Uh, and uh, when I speak about, the, uh, about restoring uh, collective defense uh, as, the, as the primary mission uh, and actually reforming NATO foreign structure and so on and so on, usually some of the colleagues from, uh, from uh, Western uh, allies, they, among Western allies, they, they think that we Eastern Europeans are going to ex expect more sort of uh, forward presence uh, being sent to... Actually, not. I mean, this is also about us doing more and... We have been doing more, and we will, we will do uh, more in the future. I was just uh, this afternoon uh, at, at the Latvian MOD. I spoke with my good colleague Yanis Garrison about what they do here in Latvia, about the uh, about collective defence, about total defence concept. This is absolutely, uh, the, the, I mean, uh, key to the to the alliance yeah. future and to the economy of uh, of effort. So, yeah, just just that remark to, the, that I would add to. to Very quick, we've got a minute and a half left. Baiba. What I want to say is that, um, indeed, I think when, when we try to imagine, again, what you said, the future, the future battlefield, the, the challenges that we have, it's actually important to have that creativity and exercise and try to really practice all parts of, of our imagination, but also our, our work and action, uh, both on the political military side, you know, the civilians and, and the whole society approach in that. And uh, when we think of that, indeed, uh, the economy plays a big role, but from other hand, we also know that our economies have been quite resilient, eh? yeah. Yeah, yeah. even in the post-COVID yeah. era, when we look at it, you know, our economies are not doing badly, right? Yes, there are rising uh, energy prices for one reason or the other. Yes, there are external challenges. It's not like they have never been there. Eh? It's not so new to, to be Europeans or Americans or, or, or others 
in the world. But I also would like to underline the, the global partnerships uh, that will become ever more important. So the division between Europeans and Americans or, or Australians or others will become less important because yeah. it will be all of us actually sharing and trying to understand and then uh, to also have that action ready to, to, to react to what is happening. I think this is really where the values, the sort of uh, more or less democratic partnerships come into play. And, and there will be, you know, sort of soft alliances all around the world. It's just, it's just the reality that is there. Thank and you. it's great for NATO, it's great for the EU, it's great for, for all of us. Eric, would you forgive me? I have to close this session because I have an important guest that I have to introduce. Uh, uh, it's now zero seconds, so I'm formally closing this session. I'd like to thank my three distinguished panelists. Would you join me in saying thank you? Thank you very much. I guess this is thank you. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you. For the uh, closing remarks of today, I have the honour to welcome the Mayor of Riga sister, uh, City, uh, Mr. Martin Starkis. Mr. Starkis, please. Ah, good evening. Good evening, sir. Very nice to see you. Thank you. Dear delegates, excellencies, participants, organizers, and guests of Riga Conference 2021, welcome to Riga. And um, I would like to see you all here in a person. But on the other hand, um, a lot of discussions here are about hybrid threat issues. So it's befitting that the conference is set in a hybrid format. So thank you to everyone who visiting the city remotely. During the last 16 years, the Riga conference has become one of the Latvia's key events, clearly confirming our place in democratic international commune. I'm very happy that those who are in a favor of sustainable world development, of secure and happy societies, Center their human dignity and freedom, and the creating a green and climate friendly environment are gathering here for years. When the new challenges arise, new solutions are being formulated in Riga Conference. And Riga today also has the ambition to put new solutions in practice. When I first said that Riga should become the first climate neutral city in Baltics, they were those who shouted that I want to get involved in rescuing polar bears. But most realized that it was about clean air, harmonious, quiet environment, lower bills for people in energy in efficient homes and stable future for our children and grandchildren. And if these efforts also help to save polar bears, I have no objection to that either. With the European Union planning funds, we have now drawn up a 300 million plan for development of green mobility and environmentally friendly public transport in Riga. We would not be able to do any of this if Riga were not a part of secure common family of nations. And none of this could be protected in long term if you and others did not keep a close eye on our current and future threats daily. I'm deeply convinced that our region is ready not only to protect its security and liberty, but also to raise its voice in defense of freedom-loving people neighboring us. We are strong enough not to remain silent about what's happening in Belarus. And we should not be afraid to give practical help to those Belarusians who are being tortured and oppressed in their own country and want to leave. In my opinion, Riga would only benefit if Latvia had, for example, the digital nomad visa regulation, which would allow Belarusians specialists to work remotely around the world, but physically residing here in Riga. So dear guests, I know that you have had a day full of fruitful discussions, so I will not delay you any longer. I just want to reaffirm Riga's friendship to you all, as well as invite everyone who watches this event from afar to visit our beautiful city next year. It may not be advisable to shake hands next year either, but I hope 
I will be able to write champagne laws together. So have a great evening and fruitful discussions. And thank you for your attention.